Good evening, everyone. And we'll like to commence our committee meetings. And at this time, we'll have our athletic agenda report. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear? Thank you, Rob. Members are starting to discuss some of our meetings. This time we'll have the athletic sports. Mr. White? Yes. Good, good evening. Good, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Update for the uh, sports. I'll start off with our football team. Our boys' football team has a record of five wins and one loss. Right now, we are number four in the district in the district football playoff rankings. Uh, we won this past Friday night at homecoming. We beat Red Lion 64 to 14. That was a good win. We had a nice crowd that night also. It was a good night for football, a nice crowd. I heard the parade was, was well done and, and everything went well. Uh, our boys soccer, girls soccer and, and, and girls volleyball teams are all playing well and competing each night that they play. So I'm, I'm at all the games and they're, you know, we're still struggling a little bit, but they're fighting and, 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 and competing each night they play. Um, we are also getting ready for uh, the winter sports season. We'll be giving physicals at the high school on November 18th at 6 p.m. For, all, for any uh, student who wants to play uh, basketball. The coaches, in reference to um, the uh, to the grades and, and students, the coaches are starting to be more involved with the students' grades uh, by checking with the teachers personally on any student that is failing for that week. Each week, I send out uh, an updated list twice a week, alerting the, the coaches as to what students are below a seventy percent. And it's up to that coach to follow up with the student on a Tuesday. I sent out on a Tuesday, they follow up with the student. And then again, I send out on Thursday. And then they are supposed to have information to, to me by three o'clock PM on Friday, if that student has uh, achieved the 70% in order to play the following week. So you, last time you asked me for um, efficiency. So. The varsity JV football team, if you have if you combine them, if you combine both teams, they are at 68% efficient right now. What is what is holding them down is are our ninth graders right now. Our ninth graders who are part are part of the varsity team, and they seem to be struggling with their grades right now. Um, Russ on Friday night did not suit up eight of them. So eight of them did not dress for Friday night play because they seem to be struggling with their grades. If I eliminate the ninth graders out of their average out of that, out of that, um, out of that group, their efficiency rate jumps to 86% of the upperclassmen for the upperclassmen. Our volleyball team is 83% efficient. Our cheerleading is 82% efficient. Girls soccer is at 67%. And boys soccer uh, is trailing with 57% uh, efficient with their grades. I am also preparing for the spring season. And so far I've been able to partner with a local sports store and they have donated practice softballs to, a, to, to the athletic office, practice baseball, as well as spikes for our students. That's my conclusion. Okay, thank you, Mr. White. Any questions from the board? I, I didn't understand what he was talking about. Um, I didn't. I couldn't hear it. When he was saying about the grades, when he first started talking about the eligibility. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You didn't hear what I. You didn't hear what I said. No, I did not. She just okay. turned. Okay. Okay. I, I was talking about the grades for each team, how efficient they were, uh, or. Yeah. So I, I start out with football, and I said the varsity JV football. Com, 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 combined is 68% uh, efficient. Now, what I did also 
in reference to varsity and JV football. And I said the ninth graders who are part of the varsity team, our ninth graders seem to be struggling with their grades. Eight of them did not dress on Friday night. Russ sat eight of them because of their grades. They did not dress on Friday night. And if I take out the ninth graders, the upperclassmen, if I eliminate the ninth grade percentage they up the, with the upperclassmen only, they jumped to 86% efficient. Volleyball, volleyball was at 83%. Cheerleading was at 82%. Girl soccer, 67%. And boy soccer was at 57%. Yeah, that's not quite the part. You said that where you are to you do something that the, then you tell the coaches they have to talk to the kids. Yes. Okay. The sound keeps okay, going so out. He, what he said was on Tuesdays, he gets the eligibility report and he sends it to the coaches. And then they have to do the work, the legwork, and checking on why the students' grades aren't what they are. Then they get another eligibility report from him on Thursdays. And again, the coaches have to do the legwork, what's going on, get your teacher, whatever. And then by Friday before 3 p.m., yeah. the coaches have to do a final report to him to determine who is eligible to play the next week. So, so he's checking twice a week. So, okay, so they're not, if they're not, so they're great or bad this week, they can play Friday, but they can't play next week. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Because you're always a week behind. All right. I I I, I kind of I'm I'm gonna say my opinion. If they're ineligible to play on Friday afternoon, they should not be able. To, my opinion, they should not be able to play on Friday afternoon. Not wait till the next week. To uh, my opinion, not wait till the next week. I mean, that's like uh, punishing a child for spilling the milk two days later. Being punished, my opinion. They're always a week behind. Right. Yeah, because if you look at the previous week for the next week, you look at the like this current week will be for next week because right. teachers have to put their grades in and, and they have they set their deadline. So the teachers have got to get their grades in. Right. So Friday afternoon, they know what the grades are. They should if the teachers have put them in. Right. Okay, but I'm saying they know what the grades are. So that would be their eligibility for next week. Okay, that's what if, if they if if they like say the week before their grades were bad, then they wouldn't be playing this Friday. I understood right. that. Mm -hmm. What I was saying was mm -hmm. the week that the grades are bad mm -hmm. is the week that, they, my opinion, is the week that they shouldn't be playing, that's not the next week. I understand what you're saying, but that's not the way we set it up. Yeah, I know. I just said my opinion is to the longer after work for now. From a coach's standpoint, and then you're exactly right. That's why, whatever, that's why the coach will make them. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. That's why the coach will make them work harder. And that's also being followed. That's a uh, PIAA. Um, now, um, I don't want to say rule. Right. That's, that's, we follow the PIAA with that. That's how the PIAA set up for check the grades this week, and then next week they're ineligible or eligible. So that's a PIAA the way you said. Yes. Okay. Well, why do we have to follow their rules? Why can't we have rules of our own? I mean, I'm going to go with screening on this one. I mean, if these kids aren't keeping up their grade, they should be playing sports. Maybe quarterly or something, but not week by week by week. That just, that's just not too nonsensical to me. Uh, they, these kids, they know they have to keep grades up to play sports, and that's what we need to make them do. Maybe go quarterly, but this week to week stuff doesn't make sense to me. And you say that we have to be follow PIAA rules, let's make them our own rules, follow our own rules, these children. If I'm not mistaken, each school also has the opportunity to set their criteria. And I remember last year when we had students who were playing and they attended Yarks. If Yarks stated that their grades were not up that week, they didn't play, despite what PIAA said. Actually, uh, Yarks does this. I mean, Yarks was were a little bit more uh, stringent than we were last year, but they, they were. pretty much, but they pretty much uh, follow our lead and the PIAA. So. They they 
they um, reflect to me and, and tell me uh, how we, how do they want their grades. And I tell them, you know, they also follow basically if they're if they're now, if their grades aren't up this week, they don't follow. They don't play the next week. Also, they follow our league with that. So they just they just change that because that's not how it was last year when that parent came complaining to us. I I I wasn't here last year, so I I, I can I can't talk to that. I don't know her child was supposed to play. You were here when that happened. I'm not gonna mention the child, but you were here when that happened, and the mother had to have a conversation, and she tried to get you to overstep yards, and it didn't happen. Mm. So they I know they're. I know that Yarks was a little more stringent than we were, and I let, and obviously they can be. So they had their own rules, and I and I let them, and I I followed their rules for their particular school. But I, I'm I'm pretty much on the impression that they wait the following week they didn't they didn't participate if they were failing the week like we check here at York. And we're talking about our kids failing. That kid had a C and he couldn't play because they did their criteria was a B. True. Yes, and which we're now C. Also, we're not at a C for all, for all our kids. Also, so, so when you when you said we don't have to follow Piada, we can each school can set their own precedent. Yes, that's correct. But we were just we just and we did with the C part of it. We just followed the PIAA as far as the this week. If you're, you don't get your grades up, the next week you sit out. And that's true. But that kid had a C. He couldn't make this yards required their students have. But as you said, PIAA rules, that is just the criteria, the outline. Yeah, that's the and that's the lowest that you go. That's um, the lowest. Yeah. Well, you have to get your grades up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so the freshmen play JV ball mostly, and they, and it's, they just basically are playing up. So we had a lot of kids that in the junior high level, seventh and eighth grade. And so we eliminate the freshman team just to make it a pure junior high team and the freshmen play up in JV. And they get they pretty much get, they get more better experience, I guess, playing JV football than they do a freshman football. And, it's, and, every, and every school doesn't have JV uh, freshman football. So sometimes it's tough to get games for them. Just a, another question regarding the ninth graders. You said that eight did not dress um, on October the eighth. How many fresh freshmen played all together? Total? Mostly on on uh, Friday nights, hardly any freshmen play unless I I can't I can't give you an exact number unless we're blowing a team out and he puts he usually puts a team in, the JV team in next and I can't be specific on how many of them uh, play in a I, in a blowout game. I should. Um, let me see. Yes, that again. Then, um, how many are on the team? How many ninth graders, Jeff? You know? I think he is first. We can't hear you. We can find out how many ninth graders are. Yeah, no. <clears throat> I can hear you now. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question was, instead of how many playing, how many freshmen do we have on the team all together? I'm just curious. We have, uh, for what I counted, I believe we have uh, 11 to 15 freshmen playing. So about half of them were ineligible. Yes. Yes. Mr. Wake, what can you tell me about the interventions that are being put in place to assist these students? Because when we changed that policy, we talked about them having interventions. Interventions as far as what to do to help get their grades up? Academic interventions, yes. Yes, so we, uh, they are, the coaches are on board with, and, and Russ does a pretty good job, and he checks their grades, uh, he checks them grades probably more than twice a week. Um, he, he, he's pretty much on top of it. He's been talking to the teachers. The teachers, he's been going to the guidance counselors to help him get in, in touch with the teacher for all of his kids. So he's, he's pretty much on top of all the kids weekly or daily, I should say, daily, and finding out what's going on with their grades. So it, uh, some of them just haven't been getting it. Uh, as far as the other, other teams, they have been in contact. We put in place where they can get in contact with, with the teachers uh, personally, the coach can get in touch with the with the teachers and find out and follow up with with their grades. Like I said, every week, and then have the a report to me by Friday if if that student will still be eligible or ineligible for the following week. Okay, I'm not I'm not speaking to the eligibility. Oh. I'm speaking to the interventions that are going to help these children pass. Do you know that all these kids, children are reading on grade level? Can they handle the rigor in a high school setting? Do they know what they're reading, first of all? I can't pass something if I can't read it. So I'm understanding what is being done to assist these students. And what do we know? They're, how do we follow what their needs and what other their needs are? This kid may be ineligible for a whole remainder of the season mm -hmm. if he's getting an academic. Right. I, I talked about the guidance counselor, you talked about the teacher, you talked about the coach, but specifically, do you know what they're doing to assist these young people? No, specifically, I do not know. Because I, I don't have access to that information about each individual student. So I know the coaches were advocating for their children. So hopefully the coach, you could pass that on him. He could tell me what these interventions are and how they're assisting the students. Because yes, can. if these study halls are doing all A, B, and C, then they should know what the things are that go into that component. Mm -hmm. And trust me, please tell them to let me know because they're not talking about someone who doesn't know education okay. or education interventions. Mm -hmm. It's also my understanding that they're going to be doing the Tuesday, Thursday tutoring as well, where the students can go directly to their teacher to get assistance. And that's fine again, but my question is this. We knew and we this board talked about that when we passed policy one, two, three. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how come these things were not put in place at the start of the season and having these things already set up before the season even started? Mm -hmm. So that's what my question is. Because it's like we're behind the eight ball now. 
we'll get that information from the coach. Thank you. So, um, Thanks, Bill. Sorry. Yes. So is it just a football team? Do they go to the direct teacher Tuesdays and Thursdays? Tuesdays or? and Thursdays are supposed to go to whatever teacher, like, so say they, they, they're not doing well in biology, then they go to see the biology teacher. If they're not doing well in um, history, they go to see the history teacher to get the additional help and get themselves where they need to be. And it might not be their biology teacher, it's just whichever oh, biology Yeah, is available. Because the high school has worked out this whole Tuesday, Thursday, tutoring schedule. Oh, okay. Okay, that's uh, so everyone was a subject yes. specific tutor. Just a question. If you can repeat some numbers for me, please. Just uh, the girl, I have boys soccer at 57%. Uh, did you mention girls soccer? And what was this? 67% for the girls soccer. And boys was the same? 57, 5-7. Five, seven. Five seven and five seven or my five, five seven and four. six seven. Oh, six seven with girls. And the date for physicals for basketball. Did you say November fifteenth? Eighteen. Nope. That's what you know. That's why. Six p.m. November eighteenth, six p.m. At six p.m. Okay. And yeah, I just want to say, point. you know, minus the the. Uh, the ninth graders that are pulling down the average for JV and varsity, um, you know, would be at 86%. I would just say, you know, shout out to them and the cheerleaders holding it down at 82%. I don't want to overlook that because that's, that's, that is fantastic. You know, that is, that's awesome. Um, do we need some work with our ninth graders and our boys and girls soccer? Yes. But when I see numbers are 82%, 86%, of uh, holding it over 70 for uh, great, great average. Um, I like that. It's, it's somewhat promising. I, I would, I just what I wanted to show you. I'm just doing it. The um, tutor program, is it just for sports? Or is that, I would say it's the high school. No, it's, I think it's for everybody. But I, you can't quote me because I don't know. Oh, but but, I, 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 but it's avail I believe it's available to any student who wants to participate on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's everybody at the high school. Okay, but that's just for some period of time. Yeah. They, they, they've done it in the past. They've done it in the past. No, not last year, but two years ago prior to the pandemic, they did it. And we have teachers that's not pushing back on this? No, they, they, they volunteered their time. They, they, they said they want to do it. And they've done it. Prior to the pandemic, it was going on on a regular basis. Thank you, teachers. I just have one follow-up. We talked about our students being eligible. And my question is, are we setting our students up for success? Because when we take a look at them transitioning from the K-8 to high school, now this is an educational one for, for our administrative, administrative staff. What are we doing in terms of teaching our students effective study skills, time management? Are we doing any of that? Is any of that incorporated in our curriculum? Because students can't get become successful if they don't have those skills. Now, all of us who went to college and graduate school and graduated, we knew that you had to have effective time management, you had to have study skills, and you knew how to set up your notebook and do what you need to do to be successful and efficient. And I'm trying to figure out, is the New York City School District setting our students up and getting them prepared for high school? Now, the reason I ask that question is because I know kids who attend Central, Suburban, Dallas Town, West York, York Catholic, they're being taught those skills. They're being taught those skills. Now, talk to your children's teachers, look through their curriculum. I work with enough students in those counties to look at their curriculums, and I see it in there. So I guess that's why I'm asking our administration team, what is set up in our curriculum to help our students become successful when they transition from the K-8s to the high school? And I'm asking that question because I've taught study skills. So the ninth grade academy has the study skills component built into it. So when they come from the K-8 to the ninth grade academy, part of what they're doing has the study skills component within the curriculum. 
one of the reasons why they created the ninth grade curriculum is to be able to have that component and be able to have those kids to get those skills to be set up for success. So we wait until they get to high school to try to set them up for success. What would, are we doing in our kids? I don't think that, that, that they wait to high school to set them up. I, I know that it is pronounced specifically in the ninth grade academy. That's part of what they do. That's what they do in the ninth grade they, in, in the six to eight, I've walked through buildings and seen them teaching kids how to take notes. That is a study skill. So, it is. you know, I do see that. So I've also seen teachers teaching kids what to highlight, not highlight the whole page. And so that's another study skill. So they're, they're doing it in the middle of high school. Practice that is taught district wide, or is this just something that individual teachers do in their respective classrooms? Because I'm going to take a walk through it, I'm going to see if I see it too. I know that it is pronounced in the ninth grade curriculum. I, I, I see it frequently in the middle school curriculum. I cannot say that I've seen it in the elementary curriculum. I've walked through elementary classes and seen them teaching jump start in, in different study schools. But I haven't seen it to the point in which I would say that it's as, as pronounced at the from the K-5 level as it is in the at 6 12 level. So board members, we're talking about our students with us and going on to higher education. Are we equipping them with the skills that they need to be successful? And it starts with the top down. And if we're not mind blowing, then it's not going to happen. I didn't get that. I just agree masters would not know those things that are very important in a curriculum. And we're shortchanging our children. I don't know children, kids who go to other schools. If they're gay, but they teach those mnemonic devices. They teach a whole bunch of series of skills that help children be successful in their classroom. But in our conversations, I never hear it. Trust me, I'm listening for it, and that's why I'm asking it because I never hear it. When anyone comes to when anyone comes to do a presentation for us, I never hear it. So if we want to start talking about setting the standards, we need to set the standards. Um, yes, sir. Um, I believe, I don't think there's, I don't know what it is now, but an individual teacher uh, basically helps set up how their children should study. And they teach people, myself, they teach the children how to study for their class or for their exams. For their, Yes. I mean, it's in your everyday, well, mine, in my everyday. Um, I said mine. <laughs> my everyday classroom lesson. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you're, I'm, I'm not being no out. I'm not sure exactly what you want to. My educators, do you understand what I'm asking? I understand what you're asking, but I want what you want to see. They don't know. They understand what I'm asking for, and they know what I want to see. But I'm not seeing it, and I'm not hearing it. And then what I'm saying is, it has to be, it has to be purposeful, and it has to be intentional. And our children are not being equipped to be successful. And we have how many students who go off to secondary education, and they're not passing, and they're, they're dropping out of school because they can't equip, they can't deal with the curriculum. And I know several students who I spoke to directly because they weren't set up for success. Can I ask a question? You may. Do we, we don't have college prep courses anymore? Every student don't need to be in college prep. Well, I know, so those that want to go to college take college prep. Well, I'm asking for a great question. Those that want to take, want to know they're going to college, they take top college prep courses. They do, and some still aren't successful. Right. I, I think uh, what Mr. Brill is saying is, is it's offered in, in Dr. Berry. I don't think it's consistent. Probably 10 years ago or so, when I was probably involved with the uh, parent involvement committee, uh, that was one of the issues we identified. And we made sure that those study skills were taught after school. We had the parents sign up and uh, bring the children along. 
but um, I, you know, I'm out of that arena now, so I know it's, it's probably awkward and it's not consistent with the way this is called. And even that is an intentional, purposeful right. piece on the part of the camp who want their child to be successful. But um, because a parent does not fail, the animal don't mean they don't want their child to be fail. And they want their children to have those skills to help them be successful. What I, I'm hearing you say is that we need to put it to our curriculum. It should be okay. one of our foundation points in our education, in our curriculum, K through eight. Every school district in this county equip their children with these skills. And I don't know where some of the other people live in one of the schools, but I guarantee you can think about what their children can. And if their children weren't getting it, they held them accountable. Dr. Lee, you were a superintendent somewhere else. Were those skills taught? Thank you. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not saying it's not being taught not on a scale that it's intentional and personal and a part of their academic journey here in the New York City School District. Teachers may do it, but on a large scale, it's not done consistently and uniformly in this district. And our children are leaving here, not knowing how to be prepared. It's sad when we go to a symposium in the county and they talk about our children not being able to pay, pass these skills for these um, industrial jobs or these on the job trainings, they can't get it. We've had that conversation numerous times. And our children are not making the mark because they're not equipped. Okay. Well, it's an underlying reason why a lot of our kids are ninth graders aren't being successful. And our freshman college students are really challenged in that and they're failing. They have to take those courses yeah. or have a tutor show them how to do it after they've already been in college. And then if they're going to their journey in college because those classes are not important to the make is additional money that they have to take for the trip in order for in order for them, in order for them to stay. So our educators know what I'm asking and why I'm asking. Because I want to know if we have kids who are failing ninth grade, the question that comes to my mind is how are we equipping them to be successful when they get to high school? Because you learn to read and then you read to learn. Not necessarily the ones that are failing. The ones, you know, you can pass well, but if you don't have good uh, study skills, you're not going to be successful in college. You sure are. That's my saying. We're not teaching them. But we often hear, and I don't need to make it, we often hear that we are increasing our rigor. How can we increase rigor when we have students who can't read at grade level? That child can't go into a rigorous curriculum and pass if they're not equipped with the skills that's going to help them be successful. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, how are we equipping them for rigor when we aren't giving them the skills that's going to help them be successful once they get there? He brought the subject up, something needs to be done about it. Well, the subject came up because when we talk about our students being ineligible, what are those factors? What are those variables that go into why they are not being successful in the country? Now I could bring 50 books in here out of my library that speak to that and also talk about teaching children, especially African-American and Latino males, on how to study and how to be effective. And I know Diane and Martin, we have talked about this before, and I brought you the materials. I put the experts are saying I attended enough training if I'm not mistaken, a couple of years ago, they used to give out a book. It was seven something uh, ways to study. I think when Dr. Wortham was here, that was, a, was that a was book a book that they gave out. 
they gave them every young Argentine young student that came in. And when they gave them their handbook, it has study skills in it. The student handbook. Anybody remember that? I do. I was on the board, but I remember that. But you give somebody a handbook to read, if they can't read, right? Like, what do they got a handbook? I'm just saying they had a book. I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody's talking. Y'all just have a book, but, yeah. but, but the question, saying, but the question but, is this. What are we doing? What are we doing to make sure that when our kids leave those techniques, they can read at great level? Didn't, if I'm not mistaken, didn't we have um, curriculum where they were bringing the kids up to grade level? Or did not? All of these conversations are multifaceted. Yes. First of all, let's start. Now, y'all know early childhood is my thing. So go I go on all day long. Let's go there. So let's, let's go. You want to go there. Let's start with they need to be beaten every night. And they don't. And so, and, and if, if it's a sign and it doesn't get done, so so then what? So we have interventions at tier one, tier two, tier three. We spend an enormous amount of money that you all have graciously allowed us to spend to be able to provide tier one, two, and three interventions. Tier one interventions are interventions that every child gets regardless of where they are academically. If they're ahead academically, they get them to enrich. If they're below academically, they get them to remediate. If they're on level, they get it as a push. So the resources are there. I, I won't stand here and say that kids are not getting resources and instruction to help below, on, and above grade level. Because that is something that for the last five years, we've spent an enormous amount of time, energy, and finances to, to upgrade. Number two, tier two interventions, those four students that are struggling a little bit more, these are more research-based interventions that require smaller groups. And in urban education, they're more difficult to implement because of size of schools and classrooms, but we make it work. We have interventions such as foundations, which is a national clear, clearinghouse intervention, interventions such as Wilson Reading and some of the others that kids get in small groups daily if they are below grade level. We also have tier three interventions, which would be included in like our after school programs where they're getting more intensive help. So there is a, a lack of help or resources in the schools, but there is a lack of interest in, in, in the students as well as parent involvement to be able to partner with us to, to, for, to bridge that homeschool connection. Our teachers can pour their heart and soul into kids between eight and four o'clock, but if they go home and no one asks them what they did at school that day, or no one has taken an interest in what they're doing, that is another part of the coin. It's, it's not school, 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 it's home school connection. And we need to make sure that we're taking a look at that. So our teachers are working double and triple time trying to mitigate learning loss. But if that, if that stops at four o'clock every day, then we're wasting our time. We truly are. Absolutely, so, I, wanna, I wanna take you back to tier one, Dr. Okay. Yes. Let's go back and let's talk tier one first and then we'll go up to the tiers. So first and foremost, when the children when the children are going to their pediatric appointments, the doctors are also disseminating information about putting cans in the milk of children and educating. And home is very important. And I'm glad you brought that up. It's very important. But also I want to talk about the fact that for years we poured tons and tons and tons and tons of money into early education, hoping that it would catch them at the lower grades, and then move them up to the higher grade. However, there's a breakdown somewhere, and it could be home, it could be school. I would say it's going to be a combination of both. Yeah. It's a combination of both. So when we take a look at these, these education, because I'm up on the statistics, I read them practically every day, when we talk about interventions, especially as they're designed to help urban learners, especially African American and Latino male, because being one, that's one of my interests. And so uh, let's go to 
Dr. Kirkendale that talk about the strategy that she's employed. Let's talk about Marvin Collins, who came here in our district and turned McKinley from our from one of our lowest performing schools to one of our top performing schools. Ms. Thomas was here. Who else was here at the table? Deb Nyman, you were here. Lori, you were here. We have poured money in and money out. This is what happens in this district. We let initiatives start and we don't follow through with them and we drop things off for something new. And something has been something that has been tested long enough to show the fruits of our labor. So that's one of the things that interests me now is as we bring new materials in and we bring new programs in, I would like to know what are their effectiveness, what are they designed to do, how are we going to measure and monitor? Because I've been asking that question. And even as educational chair, I've been asking questions, and we still haven't gotten the information. So we have to be purposeful and intentful in terms of what we're looking at and what we're approving and how we're spending money. Because at this go round, that is one of the things that's personally on one of, on my agenda. So we're going to talk about that more. We're going to talk in depth because when they bring programs to us to spend money, I want to know if they do it right. That's that's what I'm asking. And if now we worry about going to be a fiscal hall, I need to put my fiscal hall hat on too. And now watch our money as well. <coughs> so we can talk. We can continue to talk here. <clears throat> I've been around long enough to know we saw what the district did and what the district didn't do. And when we poured money into the other schools because. Predominantly, this kid went to this school, so we went to put this over here. But I'm just saying this to you. Dolores Penn and Lulu Thomas, they ran tight shifts. And it starts with the educators, who, the lead educator was the principal in that building, who is the instructional leader. And that person is going to drive what's happening in, their, in, that, in that school. And each year, we had the same administrators in their schools who were performing. Now, hopefully UVA could help those administrators get back there and train some of the other ones for what to look for. But it may be the case for some, but I'm going to educate it for you. And I read every day and I read all I may read every day long. I read six books at a time. So when we want to talk about education, I'll bring some more materials in and show you what I'm reading. Because what I'm seeing, what's happening nationally, and how we have these 99 schools turn around. How are they being turned around? Because this isn't something that you just throw out, but it's something that you do intently and intentionally. You got to be in there and doing the work. And I'm not saying that we're not doing the work, but I think our focus is too broad and it needs to be done. That's what I'm saying. Okay, I know I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I know we got off into other dimensions. Uh, any more comments uh, regarding the athletic? Oh, cool. They brought up the fact that when a student is ineligible, they're still allowed to practice. Mm -hmm. What? They will practice. You can? Yeah. But you know, yeah. Much, but you know, just be ineligible to play. Yeah. Okay. Any, any more comments? Exactly. Yes, yes, a conversation. Mm -hmm. We, we, um, mm, is that in the um, policy? Yes, it is. That they're allowed to practice? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. I thought there was an eligible. You're, you're an eligible. You're an eligible. Yeah, you get in trouble if we are the way you're in the field. You're not allowed to be on the field. You're not allowed to be on the field. Well, that's the other way rule. That's the other way rule. You still there, Mr. White? You not there? He's still there, Mr. White. If I somebody please check it, but I thought we'll the other way. If you're in eligible, you're in eligible. I'm here. Now, any other one that was answering the question? That's what would be our double A. If you're ineligible, you're ineligible. Uh, just, just for participation in, in games. You're allowed to go to practice? Yes, you're allowed to practice, but you can't participate in the games. I didn't know that. Okay. 
thought who was were, he was an elder, he was an elder for the week, for the whole week, whether or not to step on the field. I, I just don't know how we can uh, cherry pick what rules or regulations, guidelines the PI don't really have. So earlier it didn't like the one rule. So I'm talking about our policy that we no, set. Yeah, our policy that we set. I well, you know, but you got to go back to what the PI don't make. A PI don't make. We're going with PI don't make rules, bottom line rules. That's a bottom line PI don't make rule. And that's the change. And I'll tell you, it's not picking and choosing which one I like and don't like. PI don't make has a bottom line. You can set your rules anywhere in between the bottom and top bottom. You got to go back. I'm not picking and choosing. Bottom line of PIAA rules, if you're ineligible, you're ineligible. That's a bottom line. That's what it's for me. Okay. Yeah, I'll check. Okay. I'll check for it for myself. Okay. Any any more comments before we move on? Dr. Gary? Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. White. That concludes the athletic report. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Wilbur. Um, we're going to move on to our building of the ground, Miss. Behind 
the uh, old practice field was in Northern York. Which was it? North, Northern York? Where was using that property that they wanted to buy and we didn't sell it to them? And we rented to them for another dollar. They wanted to put a fence up there. They wanted to put a fence up around. Not what you're talking about right there. That's not what I'm talking about. We talked about those people. And we didn't let them. Well, Mr. President, remember that conversation? What, Mr. Buy the property. what Mr. Hain was talking about, first of all, was the location of the first fence where when they put the fence up, they put it in the wrong location. Place. Okay. Okay. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm talking about both issues that you talked about. Okay. I, I got then that. they removed it. The park that you're talking about that they wanted to purchase for us is a park that we own, but it's located in North York. And I think now they want to try to put like a skate park there, but we own that property up in Love York. That's correct. And they wanted to put a fence, they wanted to line the fence up to come down around it. And we said, no. Mm -hmm. Well, and now we now we're gonna go and buy a fence that somebody was gonna buy for us. Well, the issue that's is that's my problem. That's not what that's not the same thing. The huh? issue is too that we have a lot of people who are walking in those areas with their pets. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. <clears throat> That's why we want to put so around. we're going to put this around. We're going to, we're going to keep us out too. We're going to keep our children out. We're going to keep anybody that want to go down that trail out. And because you know, after all, starting your spring or swinging, this will not close off the trail. The yeah. fence will be to right. the left side of the trail. Yes. Okay. And that will include okay. our property. Yeah. I, I, and the trail will be a thoroughfare for other people. I, I, I still, uh, since we've already keep people out, I, I just, I don't, I feel as though we're locking, our, locking ourselves out. Yeah, but we um, need to keep our property of good value and space too. Speaking of property value, what do our roofs look like? We're patching roofs up instead yes, of putting roofs on. That's what we're talking about right now. We'll that is, no, that's just okay. what we're talking about. Instead of putting up a fence, why can't we put a new roof on SNP? That we needed a roof ever since I worked up here. But that was 25 the years money ago. money that we're using to do this fence is not. Can be used for a roof. Rain, but now it's just money has to be used for certain things. Okay, it's not hampering the buildings. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's money. Let's, let's, let's hear, excuse me, let's hear the presentation and then the board is all going to decide if we want a fence or not. I'm not going to hold everybody up and only the microphone. The roof projects are on schedule. That was my predecessor. Now the roof projects, and we just met for a five-year plan. So our roofs are being attended to and will be attended to. Smith is being done as we speak, but that was already in the progress before the pandemic. And now that we have a pandemic, we can't get supplies. So Smith will be done and we move on. The fence project, yes ma'am. Yeah, I wanna, yeah. So we're patching Smith roof, not caring for the roof off, but the new one on. We have money. We're and we can on, put a new roof on Smith. We're putting on a section. That's what we're I was patching in, it again. Uh, that's what I was inherited to we're start from the beginning, and then we'll move on from there with our other one. So the, the roof will be completely done within our three-year, maybe less than span, as long as everything clears up. So that's already going to be taken care of. So right now, that again, that's what's thrown the, on my plate, but that's what we're moving on with. Roofs are going. We are going to have new roofs in this district and some other things. We're, but that's it for another. We're thing. patching, and anybody that owns a house should understand when you patch a roof. How many times you get the patch before you finally have to put a new one on? But a lot of this was a lot of this was approved long before me. And you're exactly right. But we have the extra money that we can put a fence up. Why can't we move that money over to the roof? And I do the know fence can right. use that money, the same fence money. The Oh, the fence that we're looking at is we are also looking at redoing our baseball and our softball. We need to we need to upgrade our baseball and our softball to get kids interested, young ladies interested in softball. When we have young ladies and young gentlemen go to other schools, they say, "How come our area? How come our field doesn't look like that?" Called pride. So we're looking at redoing the baseball. Our guys are looking at putting in dugouts that we haven't had in a long time. We're changing up the softball because the softball was put in the wrong direction. What we're, what I'm asking and what we're asking is when you're down there and the York Reds will be in in a couple of days, they're going to redo our baseball field for a function that they're going to have. And they're going to put a lot of work free into it. But when you have motorcycles, four wheelers tearing up the field, 
And the incidents I'm talking about, when we were talking about putting up a fence, like you said, we have every dog known to man down there. <laughs> Last year, we had a visiting baseball team in playing our, our varsity. A kid in center field from the other school, kid in center field from the other school was diving for a, fly, a high fly and came up with you know what? Not the geese. That's a problem. We Central Pennsylvania is fighting that. That's everywhere. That kid had to take that uniform off. We had to find that kid something to get back on the bus on so he can go home and throw that uniform away. So that happened those during the game? It was already down. There. So that means before the game, so we did not go down and complete our field. That center field, that's no, all it's still our field. We didn't go down and, and mark the field. We did the best we can before. We did the best we can. We, we have it marked. This, this is during the game. We, you can't. So the dog came during no, 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 the game? No. So before the game. Before, okay. the game. <laughs> before the game start, we did not police the field. We please the feel we cut it. You can't you go can't always find dog stuff all over the place. What do you because you got it mixed down there with geese. I, 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 I say the same thing. We wouldn't expect that. Well again, I'm, again, it's it's up to the board, but this is what we're looking at. We're looking at redoing the fields. Safety, we're not trying to hold anybody out. We talked about putting lights down there for evening baseball and softball and other activities. All we're looking at is safety and vandalism. You start putting dugouts down there, you don't know what you're gonna have laying in the dugouts. We're trying to look at improving our facilities. You go anywhere in the county, every athletic facility is gated off. They don't have this issue. Again, you didn't have a young man come up and was filled. And you, you had to explain that to his coach and to the parents why this is happening. So that's, again, I've just brought it up. That was something that we were asked when I came on board. I'm just putting that, that's one of the things we're looking at to enhance our facilities and to make it safer. And then that's- Enhancing our facilities and making it safer. So what are we doing about the snakes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sunday, I was in there for four hours looking for snakes that are gonna come in there on my time. That are gonna come in there and we have traps. We have everything we can to find snakes. That happens. We have snakes up at Smith. That no, I want to talk about the ones at Good School. The ones at Good School, we're looking for the mom and the dad. I yeah. can't, I pulled every panel out. Again, four hours of my time on Sunday, I went in there and looked. It's nature. We will find them. It's just it's an old school. You have the creek, you have the railroad tracks, you have that big field. We will find them. Do we have but, a professional down there? Yes, we do. We have an agency coming in and check it again they, what did they say when they came in they same thing i'm saying they're laying traps and we got to find it through the traps if we want to do it the right way then we close good down for a week and we tear every panel out and look for the snakes well i think with children, snakes falling down with children's in classroom i think we need to no, they, the didn't down, they didn't fall down they didn't fall down with children that's what the neighborhood saying okay. that they told them it wasn't toy snake they said so how many what, how many snakes are we up to now Two. How many snakes are we have? The one that we found, the one that I gave to the agency, and that's the only ones I have. We only found two snakes in Central School. That's what I have. I got two. For the city we only found two snakes in Central That's all I. That's all. That's all. We only found two. Today, that's all they found. That's all they found. That's all that was reported to me. I can't. I can't speak on what wasn't reported. They didn't tell me if they found any more. Then it's news to me. Okay. Mr. And Mr. Liggins. Mr. Liggins. We have we have traps and we have uh, feet <coughs> off in the in the courtyard. We have it all over the area until we find them again. We would have to tear we have to tear every. Oh, well, I don't I only know of two. Okay. So if you're if you're telling me there's more, then I like to know who told you that and who's telling me. I only know of two. Okay. And I sent you the reports and the pictures of the ones I found. If there's any more else out there, you know, I said I sent you copies of when we had the gentleman come in. The state you found? The state they found. I ain't fine. Oh, you got copies of the state they found? You got copies of the state they found? I do got pictures of the snake that they found. May I see them? You can see them. You want to see them there? Go ahead. So if we if we can redirect, um, Jess, you can you can take that picture down. 
uh, and just put this small scale PDF up just to uh, remind the board of what we're looking at. So basically, this is an aerial view of small field, and the yellow line around our property would be where the fence would be put in. Uh, basically, to the left of the trail, the trail would be open still, and this would be securing our property so that uh, our, our children would be safe and secure. And I will reiterate that this uh, is not going to use any general fund money, so uh, we are slated to use uh, either federal funds if approved by PDE or uh, which is part of the ARC ESSERS and or uh, construction funds which are already slated to be used for this type of capital project. Um, so basically that piece of news. Yes, sir. Thank you for your going. Don't worry about the sleep right now. I don't think they're doing anything this I already said, but I was going to do the best anyway. So I'm, I'm going to go no. I didn't From my me. understanding, these were baby rat snakes. Am I correct? Yes, sir. So they were non venomous baby rat snakes. And how they got into the building, mm -hmm. if you, I mean, if you up your height certain time, you see that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then so there's there's nice my department's get in the school. And Director Bird, no, Freeland, Director Bird, there is the Pedoras is right behind there. So, yes. I mean, there, that's a, a breeding area for snakes. <clears throat> but I, I don't think we put snakes on the agenda this evening. So. No, we didn't. But when a parent comes up to me and tell me that their child was in the classroom, a snake fell out of the ceiling. And the teacher said, oh, that's just a play snake. But when she went to reach for it, the snake moved, and the child's petrified and don't want to go to school. Yes, it's time to talk about the snakes in good school. It's, it's very upsetting. It's, it's very, very upsetting. You're saying but, it's not true. We, 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 you know we, we are checking, and we have an agency in there. I don't know what else we want to do. Question. The question. The question. Were children in the classroom when the snake fell from the ceiling? I was off on, but I, I got called in. But the right. Ms. I, Ms. Sweeney is saying that a parent told her her child was petrified to go to school because the snake fell out of the ceiling. Were children in the classroom when the snake fell from the ceiling? I spoke to the teacher yesterday at the sports games who's the snake fell out in his classroom. I don't know about the other snake, but he, the one fell out in his classroom. There were no kids in that classroom. I cannot speak to the one that fell out in the second place. Because it was two different rooms. Okay. But the room that I, the one room yeah. that teacher told me with his own, own mouth that there was no one in the class. The one room was room 55. That was the classroom. The next room was a goddess room. And the person who was in that room just saw the other day chair. That's the only two I know of when I was called in that Friday. So let's continue with our agenda. And then if we have other questions, we can ask those after we finish here. Yes, and, and Director Braille, I would like to comment that as things come up, uh, such as the snake, such as the roof, we are addressing those immediately. Um, so the picture we're seeing here now, Sean, with the yellow? Yes, ma'am. Is that where the fence is going? Yes. So, okay. so, so that's there, a better picture right there. Correct, yes. So the yellow kind of circumvents our property. And then we'll have gated areas for people that can come in and out. Uh, and, and then that way that'll prevent people from taking their dogs down yes. into the field. Uh, and, 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 and it'll prevent through. people from wanting to sue us. Yes, they, they love to sue us. Yes. They love and, to sue us. And this is this is a step in progress, uh, like Director Muldrow said, to have a nice facility yes. so that we can be proud of what we have uh, for our children. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Was uh, there anything else? Oh, yes, I'm building the grounds. I have another question. How, what do we do with our windows? Remember, you said our windows are so bad that we need to get new windows. Are we preparing them with all this extra money that we have? We have we're going to save those questions for after we finish the agenda. We're yeah. building I, 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 I said after we finish this agenda, if there's yeah. other questions, then we can ask those after. Yeah. We <laughs> Uh, there was an item on here too about uh, always the left of the fence and all that security part of it. Uh, there's an item on here too. 
Okay, sorry, well, that, that, is, that, that is the resolution to approve. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there was another item, too, and I don't have that oh, one. Just from the fencing uh, issue. Mr. Muldrow, you were talking about dugouts and everything else, but that wasn't respected to the fencing. You were just talking about protecting those things once the fence is up. Right, and the dugouts oh, were, the dugout dugout were to ourselves. We're not contracting that out. We have a couple of folks on the main in that play baseball for Joe Cox that we would do that. We're going to be doing that ourselves. We're going to do the softball field and make it, we're going to take care of that ourselves. Okay. I just want to ask more about the fencing. That's, that's all I'm seeing here. Jen, did you have anything? I still, I'm still on building the house. We have windows that we discussed that we needed money to put these windows in. Remember we were discussing that that the buildings really need a window that, real bad. With that, okay, with so that money we have three years. That I'm uh, already looking at the contract for that. We have yeah. up to three years. Right now we have money. Right now we have money. Why do we have to wait three years? I didn't, we had three people to do it. We're looking at that. Right now, it is a supply shortage. Okay. We cannot get supplies. We just put in for a machine that we won't. We put in an order for the machine that we need in August. We won't get that machine until March. So, did we put in already to get windows for all the buildings? Not yet. Because no okay, so let's talk about that. Because we don't put it in yet. I'm we don't put, we don't put the order in. I'm looking at that. Then we kids. can't. I we can't be on the table. I'm getting my bids, but right now, contractors are not even giving us bids because they don't know what their status is. Going to I understand we're not even coming asking about windows or, or doors now. I have. We're talking I've been about. Talking to him. That's, yeah, I, I talked to you I, talked about I, it. I just want to, let me. Okay. Let me, I just want to go on record to say if we got this extra money for COVID, instead of putting up fences, I think that we should look at our windows. And these doors that you thought were so important a couple of meetings ago, and make sure all of our school buildings have new windows and doors. What means Since it was so important that we had to have it. I mean, it wasn't all, it was just a couple you wanted to, because I said let us buy the meeting. windows. But, okay, if you wasn't, I said, I said, why can't our men put the windows in? You guys said, no, so we're going to contract it out. Is, okay, so it's important. It's an we don't plus we don't have enough staff. It don't matter what it don't it doesn't matter. That's what we discussed that we were not having our staff the and windows I, and doors and, 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 no and we you. were going to make certain that these windows and doors that are put in are going to be put in there and have insurance and they're going to be guaranteed. And, right. and we as a district did not want our own staff put in right. we, we don't also right. have the equipment to effectively install them. Keep making them but as it I'm not making your problem, I'm just stating what was said. Because as it relates to the windows, and we're talking about roofing materials, supply and demand. That's right why now, but unless you right ask for supplies, you don't know what's in demand. Because right now, we don't know whether or not there, these windows are in somebody's warehouse or not, because we didn't ask for them. We did not ask for those specifically. However, doing things around my own house, I know that I'm waiting now. To get a work here because of supply and, and, and demand. That, but we're, we're not even in line to get it when it does come out because we're not asking for them. And I don't believe that the administration at this point in time talked about that being they done have immediately been. because it is in a time frame in terms of how work is going to be done. And they already have it on a schedule. It's just that the schedule for that didn't come up as of yet. Because we're not, because we want, we jump from, we keep asking too long, we jump from one thing to the next instead of completing one, completing something. Um, I'm going to say it again. We have all this extra money. There's windows and there's doors around the district that could be replaced. Some of the, oh, look how the good, you guys saw, um, Just I, I know yeah. you guys saw Roosevelt building, how nice that looks. That's all. Awesome. They put in new windows over there, we sold it down. Miss. Much more. Just a, if I may, just a question on the fencing and the fence design. I do see that there's um, in this proposal three strands of barbed wire. Um, if we elect not to go with the barbed wire, simply because my thought is eight feet is really high, that for someone to scale that, and without the addition of barbed wire, which I think is really ugly. Um, how will that affect the price? 
Uh, that, that was brought up as a suggestion for the one company, but we're not forget the barbed wire. That says what well, that's not the, no, forget the barbed wire. The one thing you see the fence down the field down flat the top is that's what it's gonna look like. The barbed wire was just if they they put that in as a bid if we were interested in it, we're not interested. And is that fence that you're uh, alluding to is that eight feet yeah. currently? Yeah. Okay. And how is that? And it's going to be protected from people scaling the fence. I mean, we can go higher, but again, I'm not talking about going higher. Are they going to put it to a point where it's going to be hard for them to get a grant over? Because you know, kids like to climb over fences. Yes. Yes. But and, they will. I mean, <clears throat> what, what are they going to do? No. What are they going to do though? Their dogs? Uh, well, no. I'm not talking about those people. Dogs, I'm, talking really? about, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about children. Mm -hmm. I know. Who like to scale fences. And then I would bring up a case in point because of our further since school years ago. We had a young man that scaled the fence and was electrocuted to die. So I'm just talking about preventing kids from scaling. You know, if they could do the, the, the grading closer so that it's harder for people to grab and climb in, they can put their feet in. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. We do have to look at the scale of the fence. I could get that information. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm talking about. Them being able to scale the fence and getting in and doing things that way. That's all I have. Thank you. That's all I have too, Mark. I just wanted to know what I brought up the fence. Too. Thank you, Madam Moore. We'll go to the cafeteria agenda, which will be shared by Madam Moore. And right back, uh, if Mr. Pomacy is available, uh, I go to my board uh, over here, my committee people. If Mr. Pomacy is available, can you show us an update, please? Yeah. Mark, are you there? Oh, I'm, yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. Good evening. Um, got the report here for the month of September. Um, for the month, we only actually had one um, special event or function, and that was a two-day meeting uh, at the administration building when we uh, catered both breakfast and lunch. Um, with respect to staffing, uh, we thought that we hired five people, um, new employees in September, but unfortunately... Uh, two of them declined their offers. Uh, we have submitted four additional new hires for approval this month to the board uh, and have recently lost a 6.5 hour cafeteria assistant slash driver um, to another department within the district. So we're still shuffling people around a little bit, but we're finding our way. Uh, we currently have eight open positions uh, in food service across the district uh, in all the buildings. Um, and then the last thing that I have for this evening for government commodities uh, for the month of September, uh, we use $28,973 worth of stock uh, and our ending inventory totaled $75,391 worth of government commodities. And that's my report. Any other questions for the board? Yes. Mr. Kavinsky, you said that we have eight open positions? Yes. Could you specify what those positions are for me, please? I don't have them on top of my head. Um, we've got one position at Devers, a three hour at Devers. We've got a three hour position at Good. Um, we've got a, a six and a half hour position that's going to be opening up at Hannah Penn. We've got a four and a half hour that's going to be opening up at um, Jackson. Um, we've got a three hour at McKinley, a three hour at Smith, and a six hour at the high school. Off the top of my head, I, I'm not saying that's 100% accurate. That's okay. I was just wondering what the, what the, um, what the hours were. And you, you gave me that information. Thank you. You're welcome. Have 
question is how the cafeteria is moving along. Uh, yes. Is had a, a completion date, I think, of next month, November. Am I right about that? What right. Um, actually, um, yeah, we've got, obviously, we've got the floor in, as I reported last month. Tomorrow, we've actually got um, the installers coming at 7 a.m. They're going to be in the cafeteria between 7 and probably 10 a.m., uh, just verifying measurements, uh, looking, surveying the place, because they're the people who actually have to put up um, all the wall graphics and in install the furniture. Um, right now, we're anticipating getting that furniture delivered towards the end of this month uh, and have everything installed. And then the last piece uh, is the video screens that will be installed right now tentatively prior to Thanksgiving. So we're hoping to have it all wrapped up before Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. So you're saying at least we can do a Christmas celebration for our cafeteria. Right. You said it should be wrapped up maybe by Thanksgiving. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Is there anything else? And I just see one thing from Mr. Haynes about the finances for the cafeteria. Dr. Barry, do you have anything? Well, yeah. That's for my report. Thank you very much, Madam Board. Now we'll be moving to our educational programs chaired by Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Cleveland. I'm um, all committee members who are present. And first up is Superintendent Presentation up here. I am going to defer to the school police for their presentation first so they can get going. Good, e good evening, board and cabinet members. Good evening. Good evening. All right, we're here to have a few, I have a recommendation for you all. Replacing our TCP um, launcher wood burner. Launcher. That's what we currently have right now is a TCP launcher. And basically, what that is, it's a non lethal um, pepper ball that um, has projectiles that releases um, pepper spray. Um, yeah, they rolled that to us a while back. Yes, yes. We had about three, four years now. Um, I looked into this company. I actually had the company come down from Kansas, um, spent a lot of time reviewing the product, comparing the product, what we currently have. Um, and the biggest issue that we're experimenting, experimenting is the effectiveness. Um, we're having when we do our annual training with all the school police officers, we're having. You got to move away from the camera. You're blocking the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, we got a lot of rules. Go behind him and look forward that way. I apologize. Go behind him. So then he can't see the screen. But if he goes there, he can't see the screen. Is that fair? <clears throat> There you go. All right. So the company came down from Kansas, and um, I spent a lot of time firing the burner launcher, um, touching it, filling it, um, because the issue what we're currently experiencing is the effectiveness what we currently have. Um, we do annual training with all of our officers, um, and during the time of the training, we're experiencing um, they hold seven rounds. Out of the seven rounds, we're only getting out two rounds. Um, that's very concerning. Um, very concerning. Where this is our highest level of force that we have as a sworn police officer. Um, and we added this feature, um, the non-lethal, to have an additional protection for our students, staff, and visitors. Um, I was very impressed from the size, 
the functionality of the burner compared to the TCP what we currently have. Uh, one of the biggest key points is time. The TCP currently has a screw mechanism. If you want a screw mechanism that we have to twist to puncture the CO2, which is going to give the power for the projectile to fire through the launcher. Now, that's a long process, uh, but we've been managing it, um, trying to come up with ways how in the event we had to use it, how are we going to do it? But like we always say, you don't know how you're going to react if you never were punched in your mouth. So with the burner, it's easy as pulling the trigger one time that's going to puncture the CO2 and then it's going to be rapid fire from there. Um, so that is the biggest key point because time saves lives. Um, and also, you wanted to change the next object. So what we will be getting, um, 15 launchers that will outfit your entire school police department. Um, we will be getting projectiles for every officer, posters for every officer. Um, it also comes with a three-year warranty. Three-year warranty. Uh, we also will be giving a nurse, what we use for our annual training. With that, Berna will be training two school police officers to be trained or trainer. Uh, we will have an extensive, rigorous training every single year, past or fed, um, for every single officer. Uh, with this, we do have our course continuum that the board adopted back in, I believe, in 2016 uh, with the TCP. Um, Magazines will also be part of that. So we'll be outfitted with anything. We don't need anything. And the price to have 15 launchers, have every gear outfitted, was a fraction of the cost of just getting the TCP. Um, the repairs for the TCPs is very time consuming, um, which is also an issue so if it goes down, the length of time that um, we're sent a new one. With Burnham, they're more law enforcement um, friendly, uh, where they know the severity, they know if one of them goes down, hey, we need to send them one the next day. Um, so it's basically the cost, effectiveness, and just being ready. Uh, we've been experiencing, I had one incident with one of my officers, um, just due to the bulkiness of the TCP. Uh, student um, accidentally bumped that screwing mechanism, which you see here, which is just loose, loop, which punctured the uh, CO2 and which sprayed out. Um, so we want to alleviate any harm or anything when my officers have to interact with our students on a daily basis, even if it's just walking down the hallway. Um, we just, it, it's just time. Um, you know, and a recommendation and hopefully approval from the board to just move on from the TCP on something that's going to be more practical, more efficient, um, and also the cost. Um, and going with, with a company that's more law enforcement based um, and understanding it. Next slide, please. So, this is just the comparison here. Uh, you can actually see uh, the burner compared to the pepper ball TCP just in the size. Uh, so we will get a much smaller um, compact um, tool versus the pepper ball that is mainly made out of hard plastic. How would you say? The right here, this is the TCP. This is the uh, the launcher here. This is the TCP here. You got a TCP over on this side and then the burner. 
Burn is here, and the PCB is actually here. So you can see this is what we have, which is much larger. Yes. So that just gives you the size right there. You know, and I have female officers, so I also got to consider them as well. So you can just see the, the woman's hand here um, compared to what we are recommending and what we currently have. So going to the point of having to screw this knob here to get the power, then correctly aim, fire, that's time. And on top of your emotions and you know you're you're going through what's currently happening. So just wanted to just give you a size comparison of what we currently have, which is the TCP and also the uh burner. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 For one time that puncture the CO2 cartridges and Pull again, that's going to fire the projectile. Could you tell us how long this has been the other the PCB? Three, four years. Four years, actually, sorry. So it's actually really mm -hmm. time to get it. It knew, yes, it yes. It's anyway, just, yes. If you want to get this better one, that's more effective, yeah. more reliable. Um, and like I said, we need something that we could. You know, coming back with potentially what we're all facing. Um, and also, we know that this right here will respond when needed to. Because um, right now, in all honesty, I really just throw it at something versus taking the risk of firing it and the chemical is exposed to me. So that right there just takes me out of the game. And now I can correctly do my job and assist and to aid to the situation. It's, it's time. I mean, it, uh, TCP was like the only company around that reached out to us. Um, and like I said, looking over the whole entire department, going through a lot of things to try to find, obviously, to save money. And also, they're going to give us something that's going to get the job done. I have some questions. My first question is this. Give scenarios of when this cover ball or the burner would be used. In what instances? Any life dangerous situations, such as if we happen to have an active shooter, uh, or we have an individual that breaches our building that has a weapon, such as a knife, a firearm, that's the only time we will use this TCP burner launcher. We've never used it yet, Mr. Shooter. Well, you know, the reason why I'm asking is because <coughs> we're in the we're in the, the business of educating. And I just want to know how this related to the safety of our students. You're talking about this device being used if someone breaches our boundaries and someone comes in and they're a threat. Yeah. But this isn't being used to disperse or used on students. No, no. I just want to no. get clarification because no, I mean, not at all. When we, when we started this conversation, that's not what was said. So I just wanted to make sure. Not at all. The, all my officers, because I'm looking at a video of this now, and I'm like, I hope they plan on doing this for our students. No, <laughs> this our we have a very in depth course and tenure, and without a doubt, officers pull this firearm, this launcher out will be used for a life or death situation where one, they will have to see the firearm. They will also have to see the knife. Um, that's the only time we will deploy the burner. Okay, I have a question. So here's the burner. question. <laughs> question. How much is it? And what is the savings compared to Comparatively. All that outfitting the officers, posters, event towels, training the nerds will cost us less than $10,000. For the whole kit? For the whole kit with the three year warranty, with the two of my officers being trained to trainers, um, warranty. Um, now we're up for renewal for this. And I can just flat out tell you, you know, I'm just going to look at to get the 
uh, a nurse for this is going to cost me half the price of getting a whole new system and going going further with the additional training every year um, the cost for the inerts is half the price than the TCP. Right. And um, that's my question. How long has this product been on the market? This this product, talking to um, the sales lady and doing my resource research, um, it's about five years that this has been on the uh, the market. And it actually last year they actually sold twice the amount of launchers than Peppercorn TCP. Do you know what it should be to the, the other? And why well, no. School the shootings is, a, is it the functionality? Yes. Aside from the school shootings, that we the functionality, have. the size, um, and the reliability. That's how, I mean, any law enforcement uh, personnel, uh, yeah, it's, it's the functionality. It's all the steps. You know, you're running to an active shooter. With all that stress, I got to twist this, make sure it makes the correct um, lineage to puncture the CO2, then I got to get out and aim and so forth. So it's so many steps that we have to do in a heightened situation where, like I go and said, you have never punched in your mouth, you don't know how you're going to react. Um, I do have another question. So you said this is selling the price again, was more? I can actually. Or, well, it. just, a, just about uh, $9,500. $9, is that for all 15 launchers? Yes, launchers, posters, posters magazines, okay. projectiles, every single thing, every single thing. And you said we would have to take half as much to get those. Just for the just for the inert itself, just for the training. I would have to spend that amount, that amount of money. Um, it's, it's just very expensive. And after so many years, are you still going to face them? Um, with looking and, like I said, like playing with the burner, like the sense of time that we've been playing with them, um, touching, like you can literally run over a car with them. So the durability is here. These here, we drop them, they break. That's okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So um, we're going to have these around. A very long time. And they're I'm saying about, about 10 years. So they say about 10 years. To to right? You're right. And then my other question is with the rigorous training each year, how will you um, work that into the daily schedule of your staff? Um, how does yeah, how does that work and where would the training take place? Summer months, uh, where we usually do our annual <coughs> training that small scale of baseball. <coughs> uh, uh, we do have, um, we get mainly do our training during the summer months at Smalls Field. And like I said, it's going to be multiple scenarios. Um, my officers are going to have to run a few laps. They're going to have to engage um, at a kneeling, standing, um, laying down position, firing these reflectors, going, and also scenarios with the classroom. Um, just depending on, because you, you know, there's something going on in the classroom. So, I pretty much mapped out almost every single scenario conducive to um, what we do on a daily basis just to get the officers ready, get them trained, um, going through getting their blood pressure low and your heart racing a little bit, um, then engaging just so I can see, feel, adjust, correct, just to see how they're going to react. And, you know, and so, I'm sorry, so they'll actually be exposed to the Pepper product itself, so it will be live right. fire. Similar yeah. to someone that's been pepper sprayed or right. a taser or something like that. Uh, have you figured out a scenario that say the board rejects this? What are some of the alternatives to combat an active shooter that we currently have in place? Um, to be honest with you, I don't think there's nothing else. We're we don't have anything else to say an active shooter would come in now. You guys are not prepared to fight an active shooter. Is that what you're saying? We have our pepper ball. Oh, we have the, we have the pepper what you, ball. What you currently have. What we currently have that's basically 25% of 
objective where we might be exposed and taken out of the game would be a little bit Probably a better question is have we not had a pepper ball in place? The good old fashioned before this was in, a, a, in effect four years ago. When did we, what plan did we use? We had a team, which was our higher one. Okay. Um, but taking what, I mean, I don't want to go off subject, but taking a basically what we currently have, the taser. Ain't nothing just I'm just gonna be open and honest. Ain't nothing gonna be able to combat what uh, a lethal weapon just across the board. This gives us time and this gives us distance until responders are coming where we can hold at bay that intruder. And the taser was 15 feet of string where it has to make contact. So that puts you more at half, yes. Okay. If it makes contact, um, and we have to get even closer, um, and our hallways is pretty lengthy, right. so that is it would be impractical to have a taser, um, or even going with any, even the TCP or burner going for the gun. I'm just going to be open and honest, but this gives us some leeway and some time. In distance to preserve the life of our student staff um, and visitors. And we're, I could fire at 50, I was firing at 50 yards on target. 50 yards, I actually went back almost um, 80 yards, dead on target. Boom, boom. Where that gives us some time. And the advantage that we have is we know our building, so we know where to cover at, uh, concealment. Uh, where we can use this and have that extra distance of engaging right. while we're still protecting us. So our comparatively, the TCP and the burner, um, uh, as far as distance-wise, they're pretty comparable. They're right. like somewhat the same. As I recall the presentation at that time, it was Chief uh, Michael Muldrow that had uh, that presented at this time. Um, so the last thing, and I will relinquish the microphone here, is a comment, is that I'm glad that you're here. Um, as we had, uh, Dr. Barry had brought it up that uh, it's something that's going to be proposed to the board, and how much it reminded us that how much it did cost us with the TCP in comparison to what you are wanting to present with the burner, um, and how the TCP um, just so quickly how uh, the effectiveness, for lack of a better term, um, doesn't even compare. I felt uh, to what the burner has um, to spend so much money back then. I think it was like thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. My my comment then was I felt duped. You know, man, we bought the snake oil. You know, and. Um, and the reason for my line of questioning and asking so many questions, I just want to make sure, you know, um, we do want to be cognizant of the money that we are spending. We're talking about fences, windows, roofs, and everything else. You know, this is, you know, falls in line with that. And, you know, just taking upon our fiduciary responsibilities. Um, I like, <laughs> if I may comment, in my opinion, I like the price in comparison to what the T TCP that we spent five years ago on it. Um, I'm just hoping in two, three years that we're not looking at the same thing. Oh, this isn't, doesn't have the best, you know, as effective as we once hoped. So that's the only reserve reservation that I have about it. But otherwise, it, it sounds like a great deal for the money. And like I said, like I'm a sales, I, you know, I, I'm a sales guy, and I get it. Um, and like I said, I'm more of the quality and um, being, re, you know, the put my guys in a good state where we could have a tool that's actually going to work. Because um, it's very frustrating having this TCP with the chemical heat fire back at us. This is this is just a waste of on our duty belt, duty belt. So the time I spent with the burner and playing with it, dropping it, like I said, I just I, I can repeat it over and over. Um, and the durability and the functionality of it 
Um, it's just night and day. I mean, just from just that I didn't want to go on long, but just I'm thinking I got a lot of stuff that I'm thinking. I'm an investor do at the high school. I see someone approaching those doors with a gun. You know, my thing is now I'm so close. I got to be able to get this thing ready in a matter of seconds versus twisting, making sure it's all sealed, then pocket second matter. So um, you're absolutely <clears throat> right. And I can um, I don't want to guarantee too many things, but uh, we won't be back in two years. Um, um, we did a very extensive um, background with this. I asked so many questions. Um, when I every time I call, they say, hey, T. Johnson, uh, you got another question. So that's the type of uh, research. I well, I have you asked this question? <laughs> because my question is, as they start talking about the dispersing of this chemical, my question is, once you get the assailant, and we may have children in the hallway what is the range and how will this disperse if we have this incident where someone breaches and we have students walk through the hallway and we have to hit this assailant how effective would be or quickly could the children get out of the way before they're impacted by the chemical that's released because i was watching this video and it didn't seem like there was a, a large gray radius so that's why I was asking the it's, question. As soon as you ask it, I I'm gonna step. And it's powered like it's not like a liquid. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I just want to know how far does it spread and if the kids are in the hallway, would they be able to get out of it before they're impacted? By it? <coughs> oh yes. And just what we have set up, just looking at the high school there, I could say we are the only school in Pennsylvania that has a camera operator. And obviously having a school police officer that know our building, um, you know, in and out and what the protocol that we have in place. And I can tell you one thing about the kids. If you hear lockdown, 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 or in and out, they're going, they're running. Um, but the spread is very small, uh, where um, the good thing with this, there's no report. So it's just straight fire, um, where that projectile will hit the target, um, the chemical will expose, um, and give us some time to react. And we're getting the ventilation system shut down in the school. That's, that's one of our protocols. As we deploy pepper spray, call maintenance right away, shut down the ventilation so it's not sucked throughout the school as well. Mm -hmm. I have one question. You wouldn't shoot them with children in the hallway, would you? No, no. Okay. That's there is absolutely um, no, I mean, no, in law enforcement, um, that's why it's so tricky. Um, because we, we work in a school, I don't believe there will be any officer that will take a lethal shot or any kind of shot um, down a hall, crowded hallway. Or it's, 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 we won't do that. We won't do that. One way we, one way we won't do that, however, if someone breaches that building, please talk with me about the safety of our students because we don't know if this person, if they have any lethal means, what are they going to do to our students? And how are you going to take out that threat? Well, you know what? Like at the end of the day, my family knows I may not come home. That, that kind of comes with my job. And it really does. I think all the officers, just based on the screening that we've done for the interview process and whatnot, <clears throat> um, that's something we spell out with interview questions to make sure that we're gauging them accordingly to hire the right people. And that part's understandable. Yeah. That you may not come home. Right. Or our parents are sending their children to school expecting them to come home. Well, I'm going to do everything so, I can to make sure. I'm just happens. hoping that if we need to protect our children, we're not going to let this man just run down our hall. Because I know our children are going to come. They might get out of the danger. One of them might take them down. <laughs> what? <laughs> or several of them might take them down. <laughs> like, yeah, we're, we're going to do every means to preserve life. Um, and this is very, you know, it, it's very passionate. Of, and I, ask this, and I ask this question because on our job every year, we have to, you probably, you probably seen this video run high, run, yeah, run high, right? We have to do that every year. And when you look at those scenarios, <clears throat> our children are there. We need to understand what our protocols are going to be for our children and what we can teach them. I know we have things before where 
they would go lock down, lock down, they would go for a class reunion. They still do it. That's standard practice once a month. They still have five drills in a lockdown drill. No, that 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 standard is all documented. We we we've not we've not deviated from our safety and security protocol since it was put into place. What has happened through the years is that we've refined it so it's universal. So before in the past, you know, lockdowns had different names attached to the building mascot. We got rid of all of that years ago. Everybody knows what lockdown, lockdown, lockdown means. Everybody knows what Bearcat rule means. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do because we constantly teach it and reinforce it and they practice it. It's universal. So well, like up at that high school concern. now, you've got kids who know nothing else but lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. But I'm, I'm not concerned about the kids knowing lockdown, lockdown. It's mm -hmm. just that our training students, do they understand what lockdown, lockdown means? They will once they, they get through their they first drill. Kids. That's my concern. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sent an email out once a month. Uh, Dr. Barrett, Ms. Thomas has the UF health administrators first day of each month as a reminder for fire drills and the lockdown drills required. Because you know, we have some of our kids that are kind of dilly dally around and play. Yeah. But I can, like I can say, is like we do those drills every single month and yeah. seeing our kids, when they hear lockdown, 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 even mm -hmm. they know, you know, it's they hear it on announcements, they're running, they're going, doing what they need to do. Um, to protect themselves, they they take it very serious. Uh, you know, and they don't really take it seriously. I was at the high school when we did it, and we had some kids who were serious. That's my concern, mm -hmm. and I'm saying that because I was there and saw that there were students who were not serious. Can you tell me again? Is that 50 feet or 50 <clears throat> yards in range as far as the shooting that the the distance the uh, capacity? We can, I was hitting the target uh, 50 yards. Um, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, no. Just, but that's the, I mean, that's the maximum capacity. You could go 75 right. yards, it's dependent on the fact okay. of the weather, the wind, you know. So, so uh, obviously, you have a good aim. Does everyone have that? And in, in the training, is there a pass or fail? Oh, yeah, the pass or fail. Yeah. Okay, because that's a long, Range, you know, yeah, if you're standing at the end zone and then you're at someone's at the 50 yard mark, you know, there's 50 yards there. Yeah. So that target is smaller and smaller as the distance yeah. goes. So the training are, is, are we going to practice on that long range, first of all? And is there a pass or fail? If they continuously miss 50 yards, do they fail yeah. and, and what? What do we have in place for that? We're going to generally start at 15, 20 yards. That's when we want to practice for the left of the hallways that's in our school building, um, where they're going to have to hit that target 15, 20 yards um, at different variety of positions. Um, even at a running course, then you're going to have to engage. Um, so 50 yards, that's just me just saying, let me see what the thing, let me see what it can do. Yeah. You know, and it's very accurate, and but it's not, they're not going to be a pass or fail for the 50 yards, basically 15, 20, max 25 yards. Okay. Um, so it's just congruent to the yeah. situation that you may be yeah, that's all. to use it. Exactly. And this is <coughs> where you remind me, you know, they can't do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They can do 50, Tucker can do 66. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, we're going to fall. We're going to fall. I'm going to go one way or the other. We have to put some kind of money into one of these here, either the burner or the professor, the TCC. One way or the other, we have to put money into something for the complete. What you guys need? Am I correct? Correct. Just make a long story short, but you find the burner to be more efficient, more accurate, cheaper. Gotcha. And it will last a lot longer. I think you might have missed it when Mr. Um, Isaac said that the burner uh, could last for about 10 years. I ain't missing. Oh, no, because she was asking. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, said yeah. 10 years. he said 10 years. That's why I asked him. Bottom line. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs>
and Matthew Butler. Good evening, everyone. I have the um, learning weekly update for this month. We always start with um, our learning safety goals associated with safety, excellence, personal and people. Those are um, what we hang our hat on and all that we do on a daily basis for kids. Um, I, I have included the updated um, as much as we can update it right now um, organizational chart for. 21, 22. Um, it has four vacant positions on it as of right now that we are in the process of uh, interviewing for. So um, that is um, this year's document with all the changes that um, have been made. We were trying to wait till we got some more positions filled, but um, we put there, we put out the vacancy so we could see what. Um, Doing what positions and doing what work. So, um, the next slide talks about our level of transmission, which is made it high. Um, that has not changed um, across all of those, those counties. It's not just us, which is not moving that um, needle fast enough. And uh, with the level of um, transmission now being more so switch from adults to children, it seems like the rate is, is increasing. Um, with that being said, um, in the spirit of trying to be as transparent as we possibly can, um, I've put together, um, well, here I've put together a chart so we can monthly track the number of COVID cases. Now remember the month of October is not over yet. You know, so we'll get too excited about that number. <laughs> um, but the next time that we are together, not at the board meeting, but at the next committee meeting, we will update this chart and it will have the numbers for all of those at October and the beginning of November. So we will update this chart every month at the um, committee meeting. And so you can kind of see the progress of, of what we have been doing. The cases are reported um, district-wide daily via robocall and email, and um, they're calculated weekly. I send the calculations daily to the board and calculate the cases weekly. As we continue to work with the pandemic, I will report the cases monthly to show the increase or decline monthly um, to, the, to, to this group as well. So you'll have that. Moving along, some updates for this month. Um, we have hired four hall monitors. We're continuing to hire them. Um, these hall monitors that we have had hired will be doubling as um, drivers to help with our transportation issue. Um, we are applying for four state set aside grants. As you can see, the amounts $388,308. For both after school set aside and summer school set aside, and these are in addition to the $34 million American Rescue Access Fund. So these are set aside grants um, over a three year period. And then there's a learning loss set aside grant, $1,941,554. All of those grants are due on the 29th. Um, Dr. Bowman is working on. Um, putting that information in as we get her the data to put in. Um, there is also an American Rescue Plan homeless grant that, doc, that Dr. Um, Bowman has been working on that's $309,476. That grant is due on the 15th. I believe she, has, she already has a preliminary submission that was very ready to submit. Um, we are going to do some things like get washers and dryers for the schools, to utilize for batteries, um, some of the um, different mechanical type of stuff that we are doing. So um, we are applying for a couple of equity grants through the York Foundation. They told $10,000 a piece. So we will be applying for two of them. Um, that deadline is approaching as well. And we are working with um, the company Ginkgo and um, 
it's been quite frustrating, uh, which is the vendor for the providing COVID testing in PA. So they moved away from a lot of the immediate uh, rapid testing method measures, and they are doing these multi-day tests, and sometimes they take anywhere from three to five days because of the fact that they're testing so many people. But for the most part, if you go to the doctor now, they're giving you a COVID test, you know, regardless of whether you have symptoms, which I think is a good thing, but the results are taking anywhere from 48 to 72 hours to get back, which is going to cause a problem if we want to test our employees, if we don't have a rapid system, because if we, um, we were looking at testing employees every Friday and then having the results back for Monday morning, um, if it's taking the results 72 hours or more, that's not going to be a possibility. So I am in um, negotiations and conversation with the GICO company. Um, one of the things that they were saying was that would it, their original intention was not for this to be for adults, but more so for us to test kids. But being that not many districts across the state are taking advantage, they are willing to work with us on the adults. So we're just trying to find a line between, you know, can we get rapid testing? Is it that rapid testing is extinct? Um, is rapid testing not accurate? Why is it that rapid testing is going away? So um, we are also utilizing other means, um, Mr. Bernhardt, um, as well as um, Ms. Thomas. We've been researching some other avenues to try to see if other people would be willing to do the testing for us. So we have one more than one source because if we have a multitude of people and Kinko can't, um, can accommodate us with some of our other neighboring partners, such as WellSpan or Rite Aid or CVS or any of the other places that are doing COVID testing, be willing to partner with us as well. So we are in discussions with them and still working on that process. So um, appreciate the support from you all and um, the vote of confidence to be able to test that. Um, but it's on hold until we can get a testing mechanism that is going to, to meet our needs. If, if there's no need in implementing a testing mechanism, if we get a test on Friday and we don't get results back on Wednesday, the next week or Tuesday, or we, we need results back for Monday morning. So if anyone's positive, they can't report them. And again, those are employees that have not received the Correct. The Correct. And Dr. Berry, we can move on with some of our students and on our part on our part time job I have two young ladies that have received their cards and they're Latino and they are so fearful of getting a vaccine or tested because of misinformation. And I'm just trying to figure out what could we do to better educate our students because what they're looking at, the information they're looking at, they are so they're so dead wrong with why they don't want to be tested or get a, or get a vaccine. So hopefully these individuals get some more information. I don't know what we're going to get that information. So I, I, I think right now, all we're doing is talking to individuals. When someone says something to me, one of the things that's a trigger for me is when someone says something, I'm not getting no shot because of the Tuskegee study. I'm like, don't oh, so sound terrible. Don't, mm -hmm. don't. Well, it has absolutely nothing to do with the But I, I don't think we're doing them right now because of COVID. But yes, we do. At the high school. I mean, at all, at all the schools. Um, well, at the high school, we can, we can um, they can get shot. So yeah, in a minute, everybody's going to be able to get shot. Well, you know, I, think, I think it's going to be about another three weeks. Yeah, we can educate them. The, fear. <laughs> but there, the people you have to educate are the parents, though, right. because the parents still have to give permission. The so right. what, what we find yeah. is, I'm sorry to interrupt Dr. Gary, but what we find is a lot of our kids, our young people, our teenagers are willing to get yeah. vaccinated. Yeah, it's their parents fear and they're not understanding. So that's where we really have to start because we can't vaccinate someone unless they're 18 or older because they're, they're considered an adult sensitive, but anybody younger than that, it's the parents we have to reach and educate. 
Yeah, and, and I share it with them. The vaccine is going to help preserve your life. And I know for a fact because having relatives who have that who were vaccinated and who have high risk factors went to the hospital. They did it because they got the shot. And if they didn't have they had not been vaccinated, they were infected. That's one other thing here because thank you said they they can still, you're not going to test the ones that have the shot, but someone that has a shot, he can still get the, the uh, still COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but if we have kids or adults that are exhibiting symptoms, this, this program will allow us to test them as well. But you know, the problem is manpower because our nurses are taxed to the max now. So we are specifically looking for rapid tests because rapid tests they can do themselves and then they just put it inside the, the collection box and then the game company comes to collect them. And we're trying to make sure that we're not putting any more pressure on the nurses and the staff that they just have to supervise the process of them yeah. swabbing and sticking. So it's you not more work. Correct. Correct. So, we continue to work on that. Um, we were awarded a grant um, through a federal grant through the USD um, DOE. Um, it's called the um, Teaching and School Leader Incentive Program Grant. It um, we are working with a group group called Insight Ed Education, and in our work with them, they um, suggested us for this grant. And Dr. Gloucester and her team worked on their first grant together and were able to secure it. So we're really proud of that. Um, and um, that that grant is going to help with um, teacher recruitment and retention and talent management, um, as well as um, instructional um, coaching for teachers. Um, so we're real proud of, that, uh, proud of that grant. and. Um, Dr. Gloucester's team for um, securing it. She had a lot of people that helped um, collect the information for that. Um, and she got an opportunity to put her foot in the sand and write a grant. So um, kudos to her and her team. Good job. Um, the um, they, they, they based meeting, say that three times fast, <laughs> um, will be taking place on Monday, October 25th. We will be providing a, a life dinner from 5 to 6.30. That meeting is usually one hour long. Because we haven't been together in a while, the meeting is going to be an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And any of you that would like to attend are invited. Um, you just need to let me know so I can make sure you get a meal. So um, it is going to be here in the administration building. Um, I, so far, we have a, I, I think we have about 14 um, faith-based members that have agreed to come. And, um, and so if you want to join us, please let me know. Also, um, I was asked to have kind of a listen and learn over at Hannah Penn. Um, it's not for just Hannah Penn families, anyone who wants to have discussions about transportation. Um, I agreed to have a one hour listen and learn over at Hannah Penn on Monday the 18th to discuss transportation and what it is that um, our concerns in the community. There are lots of people um, that have been um, talking about transporting their kids if, if it's over a mile and a half that they have to walk. And so they want to have some conversations about it. So I'm giving them the venue and the stage to do so. So um, if any of you want to attend at Hannah Penn from six to seven, on Monday the 18th, I will be there and I will be listening and learning and taking notes and um, hearing what the people have to say about transportation. I'm sorry. I thought with us being a walking school district, the only transportation that we really had to provide was for, uh, well, not just special, I know special, but I mean across. Uh, correct. 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 Uh
provide a cross thirty femur circle. We also provided for McKinney Central kids, so um, the homeless population. So we do right. provide it. So that is the only transportation that we are required to um, to provide because of the district only being five square miles long. Nonetheless, this is a community concern, and I, and I need to hear what they have to say. There are some options, um, like the um, rapid transit um, program, where they can pay for a bus pass, um, and they're willing to give us a discounted price. And if there's enough of an interest, I will sit down with rapid transit and see if we can get that rate reduced some more. But for, well, for the it, most part, that changes from a walking district in. No, no, no. But that, that, that doesn't have anything to do with us. That has to do with them paying hey, to transport themselves. If that's what they want. If that's what they want to do. Well, well they, just can, they can. We're not changing anything, though. That's all that. No, no, no. No, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm learning. And so if something comes up that I didn't think about and we need to talk about as a, as a, as a, as a board, then I'll bring the information back. But um, they they asked for a meeting. I'm providing what they asked for. So um, if they if they want to vent about transportation, that's fine with me. I, but there's only so much that I can do, given the confines of of, of a five square mile radius. So it's the concern. Yeah, I no, I'm gonna say it's a concern. Just Hannah Penn, you said anyone could come, but it's a concern mainly Hannah Penn. No, they just that's just where they they wanted it to be, I guess, because it was in the center of town. I don't know why they picked him, but I asked them where they wanted the meeting, they said him. So um and, and it is there there are quite a few community constituents behind this. This is not necessarily a York City parent and community led situation. These are community constituents that are coming to me saying, well, we, they want to, they want to talk about transportation and access. So we'll see, like, we'll see, we'll we'll see how many folks are there. So you don't know exactly what about transportation to talk about. You just have a conversation. They just want to have a conversation. I know that they, they feel that there are kids that are traveling more than a mile and our truancy, part of our truancy issues are stemming from them having to walk in the rain and walk you know with no umbrellas and you know um, this is what they said so you know i'm just all i'm just the messenger and the listener so so i'm, I'm here i'm here i'm here to listen I'm, I'm here to you know take take back what they have to say and, and, and report thank you debbie your responsibility to get a job too from school years ago. So I'm just trying to understand. My daughter, I had to uh, transfer her. Excuse me, President. Okay, okay. Uh, years ago, I transported my daughter from Davis, you know, the junior high, all the way up to Smith. I paid for her transportation. I didn't ask for anything. So that was my decision to do that because she had problems to go to school. Parents could be at risk. My God, what is it that you want from us? Yeah, and I don't necessarily think like like is. parents are not were not what spearheaded the meeting. So <clears> there were some community constituents that came to the pay for it or sponsor themselves. But I was gonna throw this out because we got some very were grants for concerns. Um tap into Samantha Dorn. And I'll give you her serial number. She's a dynamite person when it comes to getting grant money. Dynamite person. She worked for the district years, district years ago. Of this after Memphis meeting. So she's an outlet for you. I'll give you her number. Okay. Because I, I talked to her about this and she said she would be certainly willing to come. Okay. She did. Okay. We have, but is there a certain um, rule that say, uh, how far the ch child is so far away, we have to provide transportation. There is, right? There is, um, but the the current jurisdictions don't. There's no jur. There's there's no jurisdiction besides the Piedmont Circle kids that we transport 
that is over that uh, that that's what I thought. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what there is no there is no redistricting lines that would cause kids to have to walk far enough that we could provide transportation. So you don't have to be worried about that. But if they if but you know they're they're citing the safety issue, kids are afraid to walk to school in the morning and specifically at night, and you know, they, those are the things that are being cited. So. And it was it was kicking up a lot of dust on social media. So like I said, I'm just trying to listen to read the news. Well, <laughs> well, 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 my job. It, it is your job to listen to the community and get their concerns. But Dr. Barry, you are nobody's tool to be used because they're trying to run for political office. And that is not our job, and that's not what we're going to do. And I'm not going to cater to somebody who's running for an office just because you're running for an office. Now, reading some of these posts that people put on Facebook in terms of what the responsibilities are. Like you said earlier, your job is to educate the child. These children who are doing these behaviors, their parents need to be brought in and dealt with. They need to be dealt with. But just for somebody to make a charge and tell people to reach out to Dr. Barry because they're trying to get some publicity. No, be an activist all, all, all the time, not just when it serves you. Maybe they didn't want about it, but like I said, I made the office and I know how to do it. I never used the, the school as a stepping tool to get where I needed to be. Go out and do your life, do your crime in the community. Okay. So, they, like, they heard that, they heard it from me. So we have our enrollment by school, and these are the slides from before. So you can go down to the one that says um, on the side, just day 30, because the other ones they've seen. So um, I just wanted to kind of show the progression. So the day 30 slide is the slide that we're going to focus on right now. And what it does is it specifically outlines by grade, by school, um, our totals. And um, in the last column, you can see we calculated the, the difference. And that difference, can you go back one slide, Jess, is from day 11 to day 30. <clears throat> so we did, we did the calculation from day 2 to day 11 and showed you the difference. Now we're showing you the difference from day 11 to day 30. Yeah. Hand oh, pen is straight. Yeah. As you can see, it's only minus four now. We don't you have that on here. Excuse me. This chart. Yes. Yes. Day yes. yes. thirty. Oh, it's the last. It's the last. Oh. It's the last chart. Okay. Let's see. Well, some of them. Some. Some of them are. Some now we we had the big issue with Hannah Penn where several kids from Hannah Penn were on build, that, that were on building transfers were sent out and so we've straightened that problem out for the most part so now as you can see Hannah Penn is down to like negative four whereas if you look at the slide before Hannah Penn was plus forty five so you know we they were having there was a whole bunch of kids and if you look even the slide before that. Hannah Penn was well up over, you know, well below what they usually are, so 621. So um, now that we are back to, you know, we have what we need and have gotten the numbers together, we're starting to stabilize. Plus, we've had the, um, we're, we're, we're in school 30 days, so now we can clean up the attendance if students haven't reported. We can now take them off of our rolls if they if we don't have any evidence or we haven't had any evidence that they are going to be attending York City schools if they transfer to other places and we've located them. They may have gone to Bearcat Cyber, they may be in other um, they may be in other buildings um, and other districts. Once we find all that information out, we have the first 30 days to kind of get all that stuff together. So now we're functioning on our, our policy attendance where we're looking at first legal notices 
for absences that are over a certain point, and we can take a look at stabilizing our attendance data now. Yes. Are all these children going to the Lindbergh building? No, 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 no. The Lindbergh building is just a hub for the teachers and any students that are requiring extra tutoring um, or help. So the Lindbergh building is just there for small numbers. Um, the the Bearcat Cyber um, the Bearcat Cyber program has exploded to something that we did not expect um, for a variety of reasons that I'm not really so going to get into so right now. But children at home? They are at home. Okay, they so are I at thought that's what the Lindbergh building was for. The Lindbergh building is for, but it's for, it's for the teachers to be there and to be able to provide tutoring service for kids as they need it. So Mrs. Orr, Ms. Tanoa, Ms. Diane are all in cyber school. Ms. Tanoa is struggling in math online. She makes an appointment to come into the Lindbergh building to work with Dr. Gloucester in math because Dr. Gloucester is the math teacher. And Mrs. Orr needs some help in English. Dr. Barry is teaching English. You can come for tutoring at 1 o'clock on Tuesday. So the building is available for that. Basically, all being taught at home. Online, correct. Correct. It's it's available for yeah. services. Yeah, I, I misunderstood that direction. Yep. I thought that's what that building. Was. So first of all, we're up to over 600 kids in that program. We only wanted that program to have 300 kids because that's what we hired. Because of the K8, that's 388. Correct. So those numbers are way higher than we anticipated. And we are not adequately staffed for 600 people. So, um, 620 some odd people to be exact. And that is more than a couple of our K-8s. So, that's a problem. Can you put a cap on it? Or? Well, we attempted to put a cap on it. Um, and so, we are still having some, some pushback with that cap. But we are not accepting kids for Bearcat Cyber. Um, not even for extenuating circumstances because if you don't start the semester in there it is very difficult to get caught up if you start week three or week four and you're behind and if you're doing um if you're doing online learning it is very easy to get behind if you don't pay attention so we can't have kids running from one program to another because you know my babysitter changed, or um, I, I, they just learn better online, or you know we we have to set boundaries, we have to stick to those boundaries, we have to be fair to the Bearcat Cyber staff as well as we have to make sure that the that the the placement is proper for kids. We can't stick kids in there because we think it's best. Like we have to make informed instructional decisions based on their needs. If students are NES ELL students, that program is not appropriate. It's not appropriate for students who speak no English to, to learn in Bearcat Cyber full time. It's just not built for that. It, it, it's not us refusing them. It's not us saying that we don't want them, but it's not designed for the non-English speaking learner. It's also not necessarily designed for severe complex needs students. If students are unable to talk and participate, it's difficult for them to be a part of that program. And for us to successfully and to adequately meet students' needs, we need to make sure that we're putting the right students in that program and that we're not utilizing it as a dumping ground. Because if we do that, you know, we are, we are, taking the program in a direction where that group of people can't be affected. And that's me saying it as politically correct as I can. So. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, what is the PPE that about this? I mean, because I mean, we still have meetings with them every month, right? We have meetings with them twice a month. And, uh, you know, we have to offer a cyber option. Um, and 
PDE doesn't necessarily tell us how it needs to look or what it needs to be. That's for us to kind of, yeah. you know, put together. But if we told so, them we needed more money to help us out. Well, yes. but, but I don't necessarily think that money is the problem. The, the problem is educating the staff that just because a kid is struggling doesn't mean that Bearcat op Cyber is the best option for them. And if I'm struggling that's in the class, that's going to be worse for me going to go Bearcat option because I'm a cyber option because I'm going to be lost. Because cyber requires discipline. Yeah, right. And let's be, real, let's be real honest. One of the biggest problems in urban education is our kids lack the discipline. We were talking about that earlier to be able to learn in an online environment independently. It's not like you have, that's, that's a self-paced program. The teachers are there to provide tutoring and push and support, but they're not there to provide, you know, all day, every day lessons online. That's not what that program they're is. They're not over there all day. They are there all day, but they're, they're every not. Every day and all day. Every day and all day, but they're there for tutorial purposes, which is very different than instruction. So, um, it's a different it's a different learning mechanism and we, we have to make sure that we understand what it is and, and just speaking from some parents that i've been communicating with i guess they need to be there need to be more information in terms of how they're accessing the classes and that information because i think that was not very clearly explained Find that there are some people struggling with that. And they are available by appointment. And so, and the teachers are more than willing. They're, they're there and they're, they're more than willing to help. Um, Dr. L is also helping with some of the biology load because he's a biology person and he's been helping. Several of them are kind of taking on extra roles to try to make more of a, a meaningful a situation for the students that are struggling. But um, that program is bursting at the seams, and we're eventually going to have to hire some more teachers. That, that, that is where we're going. If we're going to have 600 folks and we want to effectively service them, we're going to need more than 10 teachers. Because that's so all. In other words, the parents still they just don't want this piece to like in the building. Well, it's some, it, 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 it's some of that. It, it, it's some of that. But, um, and that was what our hope was. Our hope was also to attract some of our um, virtual cyber students back to our cyber program because we're offering just as much, if not more, than the virtual cyber programs are offering. But, but the biggest thing is um, it was not meant to be an alternative route for kids that aren't doing what we want them to do. That, that, that's the problem with programs that we get in this district you know, they get they get abused and then they become dumping grounds and then it's it becomes it becomes a PDE issue where they're like, hey, you can't do that. That's not what this is for. So that's what happens with the AEDY programs. That was what was happening with Cornerstone. You know, it's not well, this is not the best option for you. You need to go to Cornerstone, you need to go to Bearcat Cyber. That's not what it is. And and that's not what we should be doing. And, and we shouldn't be counseling kids out of gen ed school to Bearcat Cyber. We should actually be doing the opposite. So that's my two cents. Again, as politically correct as I can without being irritated. So, um, moving along. So the code of conduct um, for 2021-22. Um, is something that we bring before you every year. Um, kind of taking a look at the process and, and what we've done. Um, there's always a team of folks that gets together, includes teachers, administrators, and the consultants from um, the various organizations that help us put this stuff together for revising and aligning that code of conduct that happens in the spring of every year. This year it happened in the spring of 2020. Um, they provide feedback um, from all the stakeholders, including, um, you know, district folks, um, MTSS, PBIS, um, 
positive action, equity. We put kind of put all of that stuff together to try to um, enrich and update our document annually. Um, we want to make sure that we're creating a document that's aligned with the district goals and initiatives, as well as a document that, that's, that gets to be reviewed by um, all of the specific people that it needs to, including our solicitor, um, our student services team, and um, our parents. And then on the second page of this document, you see the features of the code of conduct, as well as the fact that we are providing translation in Spanish and Haitian Creole, because that population is growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And then um, hard copies are available in each of the buildings, um, but it, there is, there is, it is accessible from a link or board doc for the code of conduct. Okay, some data that you requested from us. Um, you asked about the YCEA absences um, by date. So we looked at from August 21st, I mean 24th, which would have been the first teacher day for pre-service, all the way up to September 15th. Um, so it was exactly 13 school days um, and the breakdown that adds up to 328 days in the first 13 days of school is before you by school. We parsed out all of the data. I, I just need you to know that we parsed out any of the data that dealt with jury duty, bereavement leave, suspensions, any of that data was parsed out. So, so this is only personal days and sick days. So the first column is the first 13 days of school. And then the second column is from September 16th till today. That's 17 school days. And the reason why you see 0.5s is because if someone took a half a day, we wanted to make sure that we indicated that and we were accurate in our reporting. So in the first, 30 days of school, basically, a um, little over 30 days, right? So um, we have a lot of absences. If so we could, the next time that you give us this chart, I'm assuming you're going to do it again. I will be doing it every month. If you have over like with the school draft, exactly how many uh, employees? Yeah. Some schools have, well, some schools have. I do. I I I think it's got 27 houses, but right? they this is no, this is YCEA. So there are some YCEA people in this building that travel. Um these are so they're not just teachers, um, anyone who is in the YCEA group. No, no, no. Only, only. Yeah. But I, what I'm asking is like But the teachers point. make up the greater majority. I'm sorry. Because they may only have I know it's not true. Well, they may only have 20 people in their school. And then they have 27, I mean, 27 days gone. And then somebody else, like, I can't give us 300. Yeah. And so 43 would be bad. That, you know what I mean? Correct. So if you, for me, you for me and for I will do it for everyone. I would yeah. appreciate that. I will yeah. do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I can do that. Wow. But just so you know, that, you know, so, so we, we deal, we deal with a, a global pandemic and um, we're creating another pandemic. Because when you have between one month of school, you add 603 to 328, it's not you have 900, not 931 days. We only go to school 180 days a year. So we have exceeded, our kids have exceeded the loss of three or four school years in one month of school. That's pretty powerful. That says a whole now, lot. Is there any schools then at the bottom? A representative of the entire so, district. The first column is representative of 13 days. The second column is representative of 17 days. So that's three is not a total. No, that's a total. It's a total for, just for the 17 days. From the 17 days. Correct. And then 328 for 13 days. Correct. Yeah. 
So that brings new life to the conversation we were having earlier, where I refrained from uh, commenting that we were talking about um, preparedness. Um, I just don't have any words. I, 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 I don't have any words. You know, I, I don't have anything nice to say. I just won't say anything at all. But this is despicable. That's all I can say. Is that this is plain out. Um, I don't know. Um, I could probably find out, but um, I, I, it's difficult. I, I can, I can ask. My question is: Are we getting substitutes, or are we split these classes? Both. When you have numbers like that, you're going to have class with We don't have a choice. And our fill rates are less our fill rates are less than 90%. So so you know, but but even if we do have substitutes, they're missing this, this much instruction the first month of school. Yeah, that substitute is just there for parents only class and order. They're not there to do any teaching. We're sticking extra children in the classroom. Yeah. So, so the travesty is that our kids are getting, for lack of a better word, cheated out of instructional time the first month of school. So, so what now? What? Like, if 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 we want to impact educational academic achievement we've got to talk about this and we've got to address this so if they had what two and a half months or three months out for the summer well we like i said we parsed out everything anybody who's on leave is not included in these numbers Anybody who's off for bereavement because you can't help that jury duty, none of that. This is only sick days and personal days. That is it. And I do have, and I do have how many sick and how many personal for each school. So I do have that. Um, may I just say something that yes. when we were talking earlier about the disparity and you know what our children. Um, you know, uh, as far as the consistency of what they're um, getting in the classroom, this was actually the attendance was at the forefront of one of the impediments to our children um, learning. And I say that because I, I have a daughter that once attended York City School District. Um, she's a senior now at another school. However, she had articulated very clearly several weeks ago with the comparison of when she attended York City School and where she goes now. And she had clearly articulated that um, she feels freer to learn in the environment where she attends now because she recalls in this in the school district. And I don't want to have an indictment against our, our our school district. However, this is proof in the pudding here that she and I recall this too that. She she clearly remembered uh, in whichever grade it was, second or third grade, that on the first day of school, the teacher um, was there only a half a day and left for the remainder of the year. And um, that she continually had substitutes. And she said that the envi learning environment wasn't conducive to what she said that they spent majority of the, the class with discipline issues. And my daughter loves to learn. And so these were some um, serious um, issues that she faced. So what I'm thinking about just having this conversation with her just a few weeks ago, that she remembers this. Remember. She remembers this. She's a senior now, you know, but she clearly remembers what were some of the issues that she had, had encountered at that time? It was Devers Elementary. So when we're talking about some of the, the hurdles in which our children have to overcome, attendance of the teachers is major hurdle <clears throat> for them. It is, and they're dealt with um, uh, 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 having to deal with uh, 
substitutes that you know there's no there's no relationship bonded with the substitute teacher they they're changed out all the time so you know i don't know what is in place um i, I just don't know what we can do about it but this isn't just something that popped up you know as i said my daughter is a senior now and she's been away from york city school district since she was in seventh grade so there's some years you know that she's had to deal with this um but i don't know how we combat the issue but it is alarming just to see it in black and white dr barry thank you thank you for providing this information i think it gives us a, an entirely new perspective i think another thing we have to look at too is the makeup of our staff Dr. Barry, you were speaking when you were talking about it, you said it's something that you need to look at and something to be done about it. Do you have? I do have some 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 suggestions and, and, and don't get me wrong. The the shortage of substitutes is not unique to your city. This specific problem I think is magnified here, but you know, um, the IU is, has been putting together some ideas. Um, they are using ESSER's money to um, try to recruit substitute teachers, as well as incentivize teachers for um, better attendance. Um, they are they they have a few things that they put together. Um, some of which I agree with. Some of which I, I don't know. You know, um, but. You you have this is a systemic problem and and we are going to have to try to put our heads together as an admin team to, to try to address some of it. But I certainly wanted to honor what you asked for. Um, but I do think um, rec recruiting substitute teachers, um, upping the amount that we're paying them may help. Um, as far as the teachers are concerned, you know, having a sit down and a round table with them to kind of figure out what kind of ideas they have like now that you see i mean it's one of those things like you keep using your debit card you keep using your debit card and then you, you finally go in your account and you're like oh <laughs> right like so you keep taking off you keep taking off and now you see it on paper it's like oh gosh you know i out of those 603 days well but for me so you know so i think now that you know it's like a so what now what that now what thing we now have the data it's really clear it's black and white it, it doesn't lie it doesn't lie. it doesn't lie so now you know we have that courageous conversation with the with the with, with the um collective bargaining unit to say hey let's put our heads together and try to talk about some of the things that we can do in our batteries just something that finally talks to work with her childhood numbers. Oh, absolutely. And what could a substitute give you that a teacher who you're in class with every day could give you because they know what your strengths are, they know what your challenges are, and they know you as a student. And if they're differentiating their instruction, they know what this student needs and they can better communicate that with the parent. But how do you do that? If you don't have consistency in the classroom day to day teaching these children those skills. And, you know, I'm making no apologies for my, for my comments because this here substantiates everything I was talking about. Yep, sure does. And if I may, if I just may piggyback a little bit, part of the conversation is um, should uh, the accountability piece of it is if that child is failing in school that the parent holds that teacher accountable as well and because they have their they're armed with this information it doesn't spell out specifically which teacher but if if there is an overarching problem that my child attends hannah penn and they have the most absences well my child's teacher well the child is going to communicate Mommy, we have another substitute today. Mm -hmm. So they're going to kind of put it together. So there's the accountability piece that I hope the, the and it's not all inclusive of why the child is failing, but it, it does have some, some effect. And so if that parent is armed with this information and then hold that, that student's um, teacher to the fire, 
Um, now this, now the, the the parent, I'm sorry, the teacher is made accountable not only to the child but also the parent as well. Okay. Having that's, in, right. that's if the parent is involved. That's right. And how can you tell me about my child and what I need to do for my child if you're not in the classroom teaching my child? So we, we'll keep working on it and we'll, we'll have conversations and we'll try to come up with some solutions. So I guess you can't ask for another call of you really can't do that. No, but you can, but you can, but you can ask for a column with great sound. What did you say, guys? So I guess we can't ask for a column of names. No, no. So we can't ask for a column of names. What repetitive what? But see, here's the thing. Um, I can't hear the thing. The, the thing is, though, I know the president. Bargaining, <laughs> we can't. <laughs> Good. That's, all you know. Know. That's right. That's all <laughs> I'm sorry. There's only so much we can do about it. No, 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 they're within their uh, contract. Uh, they, and, and it can be about their contract when you ethically look at what they're putting out. I got you there. I'm then it's, it's different. To it's different. Absolutely. Right. I, hear what Absolutely. You're saying. I hear what you're saying. Because they can have something that is a lot more that. Can look at that. Can look at this out. I'm going to say, Thank you, Dr. Barry. You're welcome. Okay, moving on. Do you need anything else? Let me know. Okay, so um, every year, we, as part of our um, leadership development and teacher development um, with the Danielson model um, of observation and evaluation, we um, encourage the principals um, um, as an expectation to be in classrooms doing walkthroughs pretty much daily. So last year um, with the pandemic, we did a, a total of about 388 walkthroughs the entire year um, because we could do them virtually as well. So this year, um, between 9-9 and 10-8, we are already up to 396. So our leaders have been in classrooms and have recorded data about what's going on in those classrooms instructionally 396 times. That is quite um, impressive for the first month of school. So they're in the classrooms, they're giving, they're giving constructive feedback to teachers um, in a walkthrough. And this is in addition to observations um, and evaluations. This is a part of the evaluation process so they're going in for 10, 15 minutes at a clip, and they're providing um, real-time data to teachers in our um, PA ETEC system that shows what they're seeing in the classroom quick and question. giving some wonders. Quick question. So, I'm looking. Hold on a second. Quick question for you, Dr. Davis. Yes. Now, when you're doing your walkthroughs, mm -hmm. Are you making sure you do the walkthroughs with that respective teacher as opposed to a substitute being in that class? Yes, yeah, they don't they don't do walkthroughs with substitutes. Yeah, I just want yeah, yeah. to make sure. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so today at Ferguson, they did 108 walkthroughs? Not today. No, 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 no. That's <laughs> not the day through. It's through. Through that day. Oh, that's a lot. Well, okay. <laughs> and these are the principal and assistant principal walkthroughs. Um, and I think the special ed team, the supervisors are doing some as well. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, I just said another quick question. Is there any reason why we have 106 on that one day at that one school? They just knocked out the whole day. That's 108. I can't see. I got my folks. <laughs> oh. Is that 106 or 108? 108. Okay. I need this in large because I can't. That's not, that's not the, the one day. That's not the one day. That's through. That's through that year. Mm -hmm, that year. Right. Right. And I 
that's what it looked like. So at yeah. Ferguson, we pretty much had 108 throughout that whole period. Yeah. yeah. Correct. And then we have some more in your 20s and 7s and Correct. 15. And if you look at good, before Chan Trust left, she made sure she front loaded them. So she did 41 every time to make sure they were ahead in the game because she knew there was going to be some deficit yeah. when she was gone. Well, so. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. What's wrong with these other guys now? <coughs> 14 and 15. 16. What's going on there? What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they've just done lots of them. And, and some of the buildings are smaller. Like, you know, remember, pre K is well, pre K smaller, substantially smaller. You see pre K? 3, 6, 11. I mean, Hannah Penn had 14. Hannah Penn. Yeah. And Wayne Penn had 4. Well, Hannah Penn does have a, a large number of teachers out. Yes. yes. That could be impacted. <laughs> what are they required to have, by the way? Required to have women. No walkthroughs. Well, when they're when they're going in, they're looking at student engagement. Mm -hmm. How many are they? Oh. There's no cap. There's no cap, but but we're looking for we're looking for substantive appearances in classrooms. So substantive would be within a week, double digits. I would say. So if you if you have like one admit like. Is one administrator, so that's one person doing those. But in all of the schools, with the exception of seeing, there's more than one administrator in the building, so the numbers should reflect. So, yeah, so that's your, yeah. Well, but like, but like, but like, um, Miss Diana said, if if you have. If you have 70, 70.5 absences in two weeks, you can't get in classrooms because the teachers aren't there. So, yeah, but the first week, because his level of feedback where he's talking about specific um, occurrences in the classroom, specific examples. So I would much rather them do 
fewer walkthroughs and have more authentic feedback. I, I'm looking for, you know, quality, not quantity. It's nice if you have, you know, a lot, but what does, what is your feedback saying? If you're just walking in classrooms and saying, good job, um, or you're walking in classrooms and saying, you know, your objectives were listed, the kids were engaged, I appreciate your hard work. That's very different than when I walked in your room at 10.02, I noticed that 16 out of 21 kids were on task. It was apparent that you were trying to work to get 100% engagement in your classroom. Those are very different comments than your objectives were on the board, right? I was, I was I mean, that's true, to go to the right classes. When I go to the classes, when I go, I see engaged students and I see teachers working. I must be going to the right classes. Yeah, you want to like that. Because everyone I, I'm here, Dr. Barry, everyone I went into, those teachers were working and those kids were on task. Every coach. No, they, 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 didn't, know, they didn't even know what's coming. The ones I went into. The classrooms I went into. Every school, every school. When we the do have, I went into, we, we do have they were, some they really were. hard work. Well, I, 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 I mean, we yeah, some really hard work. Teachers, but you also right? have some teachers that are now. I ain't going to let some other head over there do whatever they want to do. One year, went to a class, went to a classroom, and then went to the principal. Yeah, well, I'm saying, but you had that. That was about three years. That's great. My concern was, thank you. That's the reason I was asking. My concern was that these here, what, through the 9th, through the 17th, to the 21st, what was going on in Hannah Pan that there was no walkthroughs at all? That's why I'm like, is there any way we can say you can find out? We can find out. We can find out. They didn't go and do no walk. They're not. He was out sick too. Yes. 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 He was out. He was out. He was out. So it's kind of hard for one to stay in the building. Yeah. So, and then, uh, time, you got, it, it requires time management. It's got to be So I forgot about that. I'm thinking no, he was out. He was out. For a substantial amount of time. Okay. Let's get through this. Yeah. So when we start utilizing some of our administrators who are very effective, and I'm sorry, Ms. I'm going to put you in the I'm going to be now, but Ms. In a blaze of glory, baby. Ms. Thomas ran a tight ship. The Lord's pen ran a tight ship, and I'm going to say this to you. When those teachers mentioned no problem, no, I'm not talking about it. It was about accountability. So maybe before Ms. Thomas leaves, she didn't even just sit there on a few. So we ain't going to do that to you. But no, but she was very effective as a building level administrator. And Lulu, did you ever have this many absences? No. Thank um, and thank you for that. I'm very humbled by your kind words. It was a team effort. It's always been a team effort in all my buildings, but I, I don't, I've never seen this level of absenteeism in this district in my 35 years here. So it is quite concerning. In my time, I've been here 35 years. I've been here 35 years. Never seen absentee. Miss Ford, she's those numbers she showed us, they're not sick. Are they doing personal days? Sick or personal? Sick or personal? We don't know which is personal. I don't have that data. I'm not sick and how many There is a culture, Miss Sweeney. There is a culture where people call themselves rebelling. And I know that because I'm getting it from their colleagues, where the teachers were telling me directly what they're dealing with and what's happening in the schools. There ain't much that's going on in the school building that I ain't hearing about. 
I'm going to speak on it, but it ain't going to hear me. But what I'm saying is, when they, when they talk about it, they're concerned because it's a reflection on them. And they don't want to be lumped in with that because they're dedicated and committed to the job that they signed up to. So if you're not here to do your job, look elsewhere and let us find committed people who are going to come in and do the job of educating children. And I'm very passionate about children's education. And when you cheat them out of an education, it's concerning and it's alarming. And it's not ethical. We're all, we're all standing. I, I know you are. Stand, uh, as well. But and that is something I think that we uh -huh. definitely need to look at. Because uh -huh. so this is actually affecting our, that is affecting our students. That is affecting our students. And the committed teachers that come every day to do their job, thank you. Yeah. Okay, looking ahead. I have um, some stuff for you. Um, everything from instructional core team to an admin meeting, CPA, um, PD um, for the district, etc. So, all all the happenings, including parent teacher conferences. And I do have two recommendations. Um, one is I'm asking that. Um, we replace the pepper ball launchers with the burner launchers, which increases accuracy, reliability, and is better financially and um, to significantly reduce costs, as well as the reliability, the shelf life, and the fact that we have the train the trainer model and everything we need is a one stop shop for $10,000 versus our initial investment of $30,000. So um, I, I think we should really consider that. Um, and also, um, I would hope that we can consider approval of the High School Plus Credit Recovery Program to begin in mid-October. Um, this is to help our students recover their high school credits and will ultimately increase the graduation rate if it is um, implemented effectively. So I under, those, I understand. The first one, I'm all, all aboard. Mm -hmm. The second one, it becomes a crutch. When kids don't want to do what they do, what they need to do and giving it the first time. But then we're making it easier for them to let them recover these credits after they done squandered. And not all of them, but a good number of them have not been attentive to their education, but now they want to find a way to make sure that they graduate and get out on time. But they need to consider that before they want to run around the hallways and then want to get into credit recovery. Maybe you can't I, I, I like the idea. It's after school and uh, and on Saturday. After school and on Saturdays, and you know what? I know we had four on Saturday. So we we and have we to we have to offer a recovery program. We should be doing that. We should, but we got to offer it for free. We we don't have to offer it for free. No, we don't. Because we're giving it to them free the first time, and they're not taking advantage of it. And I think that if they think they have to pay for it, and they know they have to pay for it, maybe they'll be a little more mindful of getting it the first time. Now, I, I love the idea, Dr. Barry, but then again, where's the accountability if we're just going to give it to them? And then we don't have teachers showing up to get it. Oh, that's right. Well, that's true. Well, this is a number of stipend positions. They'll show up for that. That's true. They'll show up for that. Don't fight over that. There's no fight over that. Don't fight over that. But what about the students that can't afford it? What about the ones that can't afford it that really need it? Well, the ones that can't afford it that really need it, they need to get it while we're giving it to them for free. I mean, but what if they can't get it? Why can't they get it? Everybody don't learn at the same level. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. But if they're in there putting it for their effort, that's different. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's different. That's really what's happening. But if we have kids who have learning disabilities, if we have kids who have certain disabilities and things of that nature, their IEPs will cover it. But if they're out for a medical reason, that's something totally different. But just because they want to run around and do what they do, not what they need to do, that's different. I get you on that, and I understand. I'm not talking about the one or two. I'm 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 talking about the one or two. 
I mean, different circumstances like that. They're coming to school. Sometimes they got to see this school go to say three to see. I've been doing therapy for the last 35 years. None of, that, none of that's new to me. Okay, However, but I'm going to take you to Miss Murray's story. She went from homeless to Harvard. Well, so okay. you just can't say that every student, story, every student no. because, because every student is homeless, they can't make it. I didn't say that. No, but, that's I'm, I'm, but that's, that's what I'm getting from you, right. your comments. No, no, I mean, what about the ones? We're always, no. we're, always looking at, we're always looking to make excuses. Let's hold them accountable. You can hold them accountable, but I would put a price tag on that accountability. If they, if they, if they, I, I, said, I, didn't say, I didn't say you, I said I would. If I'm speaking for me. If they're expelled from school, or they just been movie or la 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 la, or so much trouble, then okay, then their circumstances, they can't come to the Kelly Turner over at Ferguson K-8 
want to congratulate their 516 for their IFL performance on questions answered and hours on the software, um, leading this building as a team. And those teachers are listed, so congratulations to them as well. And then on the next page, we have um, Dr. Gloucester and the instructional team for securing the teacher, teacher and school leader incentive program grant from USDE. Great job. And finally, um, Deb Nyman, Fran Dolman, and Gwen Johnson for their diligence and hard work associated um, with working through the challenges associated with district transportation. That has been a fair trying to make sure that we're getting our kids transported with all of the shortages through FNS, Faithful, and everybody else. Um, Deb has been, um, Deb, Fran, and Quinn have been working very hard. Deb has been on the phone and I can hear, I can see the smoke coming out of the top of her head when she gets upset with the transportation companies. And she's been coming down giving me updates. So I appreciate you all for all of that hard work. And hopefully, you know, the next time I, I, I talk to you all, we can report that um, we have all of these kids in school and learning and, and doing what they need to be doing because we were getting transported. So kudos to everyone who's got Bearcat shout outs. Um, I, I, I don't like to end on bad notes and, and I appreciate all of the hard work that's going on around the district. Everybody is underwater and, and, and doing the doggy paddle and trying to stay above water. And I recognize you, I see you, and I appreciate you from, um, from the custodians, the cafeteria workers, all the way up to um, my cabinet. I thank you and I don't take your um, hard work for granted. Thank you for all that you do to help our kids. Dr. Bowman is very frugal and has worked very hard um, to make sure that we are getting the best possible prices. So the key is that they're booking early and, and booking early is helping them to get some of the better prices. Um, also traveling, not traveling over the weekend, but rather traveling through the week, like from Tuesday to Tuesday, rather than traveling from Friday. Yeah, so, you know, traveling in the beginning of the week or in the middle of the week versus traveling on a weekend, leaving on a Sunday, leaving on a Friday. So those types of things are, are, are little hacks to help us save money. Any other questions for members? We have to vote on in the past. We have to vote on in the year. Right. Um, and that one of the reasons I'm about, about that because um, in the property of I know we lost a lot of people. Uh, we went to the But when we do that, we make sure that we, uh, I know, do they all have their computer set, laptops, and tablets set? The last bit of them will be given out tomorrow. So by the time the board meeting comes next time, we will be 100% one-to-one. -one. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
could we let the parents know that because we've got so you said got so many bags that the family messed up blah, blah, blah. let the parents know what our course of effort is about our school property because we do have absolutely to, we can and, we hear about that but i don't think they respect they don't respect mm -hmm. that. they know yeah. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Yes, I know that at some schools it's very expensive to come out to some security deal. Yeah. 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 Well, we, we're looking at a um a, a starter fee for um insurance. It would be no different than insurance on your cell phone. When you pay so much a month. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're looking at um perhaps maybe twenty five, thirty dollars a year. Um, for for the computers and um, for uses of computers for the year and um, the parent the parent would, the parent would pay. so if we have screens that need to be replaced or, or small damages but a lot of the damage that was done was permanent damage um, I can certainly defer to just some of the stuff that they saw was was pretty catastrophic and um, it, it ended up costing us a, a pretty penny to get replacements in, not to mention that shipping and freight and all that stuff is very slow. So even devices that were ordered early in the summer are just starting to come in now. So it, it's it's a it's a it's a barrier. So we need to make sure our kids have the devices, but at the same time we have to do a better job. And we're working with the school leaders as well as the um as well as the families to um Make sure they're taking care of the device, but making sure we're putting heftier cases on them and doing all that we can do to preserve them. It was. Yet the number of homeless students, the number of students that enrolled exceeded what we had. And then drivers weren't showing up. I mean, we had, we were set back in August. And then, oh, we don't have enough drivers. Oh, we don't have this. 
um, because you know it was it was it was a problem everywhere. So, so uh, that's why we have to choose orders. So at the beginning of the summer, I was, when I made the statement, well, last year, sure. when we were paying that 700 and some odd dollars every day, and I made the statement, wouldn't it be more feasible that we look into buying our own transportation and our own drivers? And he said, no, that's covered. And here we go again. And I think so, that we, so maybe we might want to look into it. But it's but my own transportation is going to be it's the same thing. That's what we're hiring now. But we're hiring, but that's what the monitors are. Monitors that were hiring, they're driving these things that were leasing. So and we were looking into buying a bus or buses or whatever it is. We got the course looking to what it would be. And we hire our own drivers for our district. We wouldn't yeah, have there's, there's this problem in that. Yeah, that on those vehicles. There's a lot of all of them. But we also have kids not coming to school because they're not getting the kids right. So we're, we're gonna, you, when it comes to dollars and cents, when it comes to the child's education, I'm worried about the expenses. That's why. I'm, and if, in the long run, I feel a little bit that one. There's nothing else in the other question? Right. Right. I'm right. still hungry. Right. Thank you, Madam. We're moving on to general policy. As a board, I think we need to look into that and think about that. I heard that coming. Okay. And we keep going that way. Keep coming back to us. 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 So the first policy you have is 006, which is the copies, copy of meetings, uh, board meetings. These changes are specific based on some changes in regulations. So on the third page, there's a change in title for meeting notifications. Also starting on the bottom of the third page, anything you see in bold is new agenda notifications. And then that goes on. And the next change is on the page where the minutes are. Number eight was added. So again, if it's a bowl, I think the page is in black and white. It's it's a change. Uh, Mr. Ghetto has already reviewed this policy. Okay. The next one is student discipline, and this is a real simple one. Basically, on the last page. We have removed all the information regarding this restorative justice academy because that academy no longer exists. So we removed that information to bring the policy current. That's policy 218. Policy 222 is an update from the state about tobacco and vaping products. So all the changes in here are either lined out, which means they had to be removed or it's bold print and these are all addressing the, the vaping and I, I'm not a smoker so whatever these people are using to <laughs> tobacco, you know cigarettes and vape pens and whatnot whatever so there are quite a few changes and they're all in bold for you to review anything we're not going to continue with has been crossed out okay and then Mr. Ghetto has um, reviewed that one as well and that's it those three. Do we have any questions or comments? Oh, 
Okay, at this time, the board will be retreating back into executive session as we are in executive session at the beginning of our meeting tonight to discuss our personal and other legal matters. 